Good morning, and welcome to the FCC's first ever forum on the quantum internet. Thanks to everyone watching online today, and special thanks to our expert panelists and speakers. And of course, there can't be a forum on quantum technology without acknowledging those who sparked my interest in the topic, Bill and Ted. Did you think I would say Scott Bakula? Come on. Uh, speaking seriously about pioneers who brought us to this point, today's forum is almost perfectly timed. Yesterday was the anniversary of Max Planck's seminal paper on quantum theory. On December 14, 1900, Planck published groundbreaking research theorizing that radiant energy was made up of particle-like components that he called quanta. Well, 120 years after he expanded our understanding of science beyond classical physics, we've gathered to discuss the quantum internet, a new frontier of technology that promises to expand what is possible with uh, classical computing and networks as well. Now, I'm not even going to attempt to explain the difference between bits and qubits uh, or to describe entanglement. That's why Dr. Al Shalom and other experts are here to help us along. But I would like to take a moment to put today's proceedings into what I hope will be useful context. The first thing I'd like to stress about the quantum internet is this has the potential to be really, really big. Now, I know many people first had their interest peaked in this topic in the summer of 2019 when Google announced that it had achieved quote unquote quantum supremacy. And I think the most common reaction to those headlines was, I have no idea what that means, but it sounds really cool. And indeed it was. Google claimed that using quantum computing, they could now solve the problem in 200 seconds that the world's fastest classical supercomputer would need 10,000 years to figure out. Now, some argued that Google was presenting its findings in the most favorable light, after all, IBM, which had built the fastest classical computer, claimed that its machine could solve uh, the problem in two and a half days. But regardless, objective third parties generally agreed that Google's computer was a real breakthrough. A computer that could fit in your bedroom could complete a task in a fraction of the time of a classical supercomputer, which is the size of two basketball courts. This proved that quantum computing can complete tasks that classical computing can't match. And other companies have since come forth with their own claims of breakthroughs in quantum computing. By applying the laws of quantum physics to make cal calculations, we are entering a place we've never been before. And we are doing things that computers have never done before. Well, quantum networks promise to unleash this power by enabling distributed quantum computing and giving us a level of computational clout far beyond what is possible with today's internet. This would be an incredibly powerful tool for solving complex problems and enabling scientific discoveries. Now, to be clear, leveraging quantum computing and communications at scale is still a long way off, likely more than a decade away. But that should not obscure this technology's upsides. For instance, when we think about the benefits, the possible benefits of the quantum internet, the first big advancements we are likely to see involve network security. A quantum secured communications link could offer foolproof security for data communications. If the link has been eavesdropped or tampered with, the sender will know this with 100% certainty. The development of a practical, secure, high data rate quantum link offers major advantages in global competitiveness. Now, if my first point was that the quantum internet is a big deal for scientific research and economic development, my second is that the quantum internet is a big deal for the US government. Federal leaders from the White House to Congress have identified US leadership in quantum as a national priority. In 2018, Congress passed and the president signed into law the National Quantum Initiative Act in order to accelerate the development of quantum information science. The Department of Energy has been working aggressively to implement parts of this law, and it has a plan in the works to connect all 17 DOE national laboratories as the backbone of the quantum internet. The National Science Foundation is launching its own quantum center to complement the energy departments. The White House Office of Science and Technology Policy announced on October 7th the launch of quantum.gov, the official website of the National Quantum Coordination Office and the release of the Quantum Frontiers Report 
which identifies key areas for continued quantum information science research. As the nation's expert agency on communications technology, the FCC is proud to support and look for, looks forward to continuing to support these efforts. Now, the last key point I'd like to make today is that realizing the promise of the quantum internet will require a group effort. Government buy-in and leadership is important, but it's not sufficient on its own. We need the committed engagement of America's leading research universities, which are the best in the world, not only to push the science forward, but also to help train a skilled workforce. And we'll also need the private sector to develop applications and services using this technology. And that's why I'm so excited that the FCC is hosting the forum today. We have gathered experts from around the country, representing academia and government, as well as large and small companies, for a stimulating conversation about this new frontier in network, network technology. Today, you will be able to hear from them and learn more about quantum's potential importance to communications networks. I hope and expect that this forum will foster greater understanding about the quantum internet of the future and highlight ways that public and private sectors can cooperate to ensure American success in this area. Now, earlier I noted how December 14th is an important day in the history of quantum because of the publishing of Max Planck's breakthrough paper, but yesterday we also got a new reason to remember the date December 14th for years to come. Shortly after 9 a.m., a healthcare worker at Long Island Jewish Medical Center in Queens received the first shot in America's mass vaccination campaign, an historic turning point in the battle against the coronavirus pandemic. Sequencing the virus and starting vaccination programs in less than one year, a process that historically has taken five to seven years, is one of the great scientific achievements of all time. For the purposes of today's discussion, I think it's worth noting that we made history because of a public-private partnership called Operation Warp Speed. Certain tasks are so monumental that they demand the government, the private sector, and the academy work together. That was certainly true for developing a vaccine in record time, and I believe that will also be true of this effort to revolutionize communications and information processing. Today's forum tells me that uh, we've built the coalition that we need. We are up to the new challenge. Thank you again to everyone for participating. Special thanks to all the members of the FCC staff who have worked really hard to put this event together. In, in particular, our incredibly talented and distinguished Chief Technology Officer, Manisha Ghosh. And so now to borrow a line from Matt Damon and the Martian, let's go science the bleep out of the internet. With that, I will turn the floor over to my colleague and friend, Commissioner Brendan Carr for his remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Pai. Uh, really appreciate your leadership in bringing this to the forefront, obviously not just of the work that we're doing here at the FCC, but your work uh, across the government as so many leaders uh, right now are looking to advance America's strategic interest in quantum computing. Now, I have to admit, uh, as you sort of joked a little bit in your opening, when I was first invited to give some opening remarks, uh, I thought I'd be much more qualified to talk about the hit late 1980s, early 1990s TV show Quantum Leap uh, that I am qualified probably to talk about uh, quantum computing. And as a lot of you know, uh, that was a great show, starred Scott Bakula, as the chairman noted, and he was uh, Dr. Sam Beckett. He was a physicist who would leap through space-time during an experiment in time travel by temporarily taking the place of other people to correct historical mistakes. Uh, that is a skill set that I'm sure a lot of people in Washington wish they had right about uh, now or at any point in time during history. In all seriousness, though, you know, one of the reasons I am excited about the work that's going on across the government on quantum is because it holds the potential, even though a lot of people don't understand the technology exactly, it holds the potential to solve pain points in our everyday lives that we may not even recognize as such right now. In one way I sort of conceive of it is the same transition we've seen in networks. As we went from 3G to 4G, for instance, um, we had all of these things in our life, whether it was taxis trying to get us across town that were solved by smartphones and high-speed mobile networks. We have Uber, Lyft, other apps right on our phone. 3G to 4G transformed banking. Rather than having to go to a, a brick and mortar uh, 
retail bank and stand in one of those rope lines and wait for a teller to transact your business. Uh, we now have apps right on our phone that let us uh, exchange money, uh, engage in, in business transactions. So it was about this upgrade in technology that could do things that if we stood at the cusp of it, it'd be hard for people to even uh, envision the change it can make in our lives. And I think that's one area of what we're going to see with quantum is that at the government, our job is to convene stakeholders, to do what we can to help uh, give this transition a better shot of taking place even more quickly. And then it will have a transformative effect on all of our lives. Um, now, Sherman Pai noted, I think one of the, the interesting things here as well is network security. You know, we've worked a lot at the FCC to secure our networks physically. And I think this switch to quantum is going to help to further secure our communications across those networks. So I think that's another important reason why we are pushing ahead on this. But for my part, I'm very excited to see what the future holds. Uh, very grateful to uh, Manisha, her team, for putting this together, to Chairman Pai for uh, having the vision to organize it. And I look forward to learning a lot from today's presenters. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Chairman Pai and Commissioner Carr, for uh, for your remarks and for setting the stage uh, for the rest of the day today. Um, in the interest of time, I will not read out Professor Aushalam's bio, which uh, I must say is truly impressive. Please do refer to the event page for this and the bios of all the other speakers as well. Suffice to say that Professor Aushalam is one of the leaders in quantum networking in the world, and it is our privilege to have him start off the technical discussions in the forum today with his keynote address. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to you and the FCC for giving me an opportunity to speak with you this morning about some of the challenges and exciting aspects for us about the quantum internet. What are the opportunities in the coming decade or so? Well, just to be sure we're all on the same page here, it's worth taking a minute to uh, remind everybody what is quantum information science. And at the end of the day, you know, nature follows the rules of quantum mechanics because at the scale of individual atoms and electrons, particles and matter and materials behave in ways that simply can't be explained by the laws of classical physics. And quantum information science is a field that's taken this behavior and engineered techniques to develop new means of creating and controlling information using these laws of nature at the most fundamental scale. And there are two unique properties in the world of quantum science that enable this new technology. The first on the left you can see is entanglement, where information can be placed in pairs or multiple sets of particles or qubits, quantum bits, and remain connected even if you separate these qubits or particles over extraordinary long distances. The information is literally entangled, offering a new means to communicate information. And the individual particles themselves, in contrast to today's bits, which are zeros or ones, two states of data, have the ability to exist in a multiple states at the same time called superposition, not just zeros and ones, but infinite combinations of these two. And these two properties together serve as a basis to build something very, very new, particularly for quantum communication. And the goal for quantum communication and quantum networks is to see if we can distribute these qubits or quantum states over multiple nodes, developing a network over very long distances, and to keep information in a full quantum ecosystem, never letting it reach the classical world. And as you can see from the diagram on the left that Jeff Kimball and some of his colleagues thought about you know, over a decade ago, this means you can think about nodes and channels, much like we do today for information or quantum channels or communication channels, which transmit both quantum and classical information between the nodes. And the nodes themselves are essentially the end terminals of the network, where confirmation, quantum information and entanglement can be generated, processed, and routed as we need. As we heard from the chairman you know, just a few minutes ago, you know, applications are emerging almost on a daily basis as we begin to think about what you could do with this. We heard about secure communications, clock synchronization, which is important, for example, every day when we use GPS, how we might distribute quantum sensors for all sorts of environmental uh, 
uh, and energy needs in the country. And of course, distributed quantum compute computation, sort of analogous to cloud computing, but with quantum machines. And we think as the years go on, many, many more applications will emerge with how we can communicate using this new form of information processing. Now, how are people thinking about this? Well, they're thinking in two broad approaches right now, using satellites to distribute quantum information over global distances and ground-based communication for metropolitan and national distances, and of course, combinations of the two as needed. So recently, there have been satellites that have been launched, most notably the one in China a few years ago, and you can see the advantage just from the diagram on the left. You could communicate over long distances, but there are challenges. There's limited bandwidth with satellites. There can be weather dependent issues. It's a more expensive process. Ground-based quantum links, well, many of us are familiar with this. There are optical fibers spread all over the nation now, where the way we're communicating right now, for me to all of you, is by sending information through optical fibers, among other channels, using pulses of light. Well, there are missing technologies still to do this in the quantum world, and we'll hear about this in the panels that follow quantum repeaters, technologies that can take the signal, read it, amplify it, and repeat it from station to station to station to send a quantum signal, say, here in Chicago to California or to New York. And there are lots of advantages about using optical fiber networks. It's compatible with what we have already with an enormous uh, investment. There's high bandwidth, but as we'll see in just a few minutes, there are technology challenges ahead of us. We need memories. We need ways to communicate through entanglement and swap entanglement from location to location to communicate over long distances. These are exciting challenges. We believe there are ways to move ahead and meet them, but it will take a little bit of time. So what's happening around the world? Well, there are satellite and ground-based efforts happening globally. This has become a global enterprise. I mentioned that the satellite in China that was launched in 2016 um, has been an incredible technical tour de force in using entanglement to communicate between over a thousand kilometers in distance across China. There are efforts in Japan, in Canada, in Singapore, in the UK, and there are emerging ground-based networks here in the United States, but also in Japan, Switzerland, China, the UK, and the Netherlands, which has an ambitious plan to link all four cities in the Netherlands with a quantum network. So there's a lot happening because it's a very exciting field scientifically. And as we heard in the very beginning this morning, there are enormous implications for security and technology development in the United States. So it's worth looking at what are the different stages that we need to think about as we build a quantum network. And as we get better and we build more advanced technology, what new functions can follow that technology? And a couple of years ago, Stephanie Werner and Delft in the Netherlands wrote a very nice article talking about how this would move, how we go from trusted repeaters to techniques to prepare and measure quantum states, how we generate entanglement on demand as a channel for communicating between nodes, how we build quantum memories, how do we think about fault-tolerant architectures, and at the end of the day, how do we do this all together to build a large quantum computing framework? And as we move through these stages of technology development, we can think about known applications and needs right now, like quantum key distribution. How can we make even our current network more secure? How can we develop new protocols? How can we use new ideas such as blind quantum computing, where the owner of the computing system cannot know what functions are being run, what programs are being run on that hardware? Clock synchronization, can we use this to massively improve GPS techniques? And can there be societal impacts leading from um, hack-free election systems to new ways to set corporate agreements to secure banking technologies? Between satellites, long distance ground communication, and even short distance metropolitan links for urban areas, there's a lot in front of us and it's a really exciting field right now. And again, we'll be hearing more about that in the next hour or so. So how are these quantum networks different than what we have today for classical technologies? Well, really at the end of the day, if you look at this plot on the left, one real challenge for quantum networks is the rate of information drops with the attenuation distance of sending information through optical fibers. 
So because optical fibers are made from glass and glass has impurities, as you send information down the fiber, the signal will slowly drop in amplitude with distance. And while you know, one, there are ways to mitigate that with classic technologies and classical electronics, it's a bigger challenge for quantum technologies where the signal amplitude impacts the rate of communication. But the key ingredient that makes a quantum network different than what we do today is entanglement. What I talked about at the very beginning, the idea of creating information among multiple qubits that are still connected over arbitrary distances. So while the quantum network does have some similarities, you know, we still are going to communicate using real physical carriers, such as individual photons. Fundamental limits still apply, but the differences are significant. As I said, quantum entanglement is the basis for a quantum network, and there is no classical correspondence. This is truly unique. The no cloning theorem in physics means you simply can't duplicate quantum states without impacting them. And while that leads to extreme security, it offers technological challenges to build a network. And finally, something you'll hear about in the um, panels as well is one can use entanglement as a type of highway, if you like, to move information through teleportation, moving information using the entanglement link instantly from end to end. Now, we hear a lot about quantum computing as we heard about in the chairman's introduction. It's important to realize that quantum computing itself is gonna benefit from quantum networks and quantum networks will actually enhance quantum computing. So quantum computing is gonna benefit quantum networks in things like quantum error correction to perform advanced quantum encoding to see how we can increase channel capacities to expand the applications of quantum networks. For example, how sensors will be attached to quantum networks and process information. And quantum networks in turn will enhance quantum computing. It'll distribute resource requirements, allowing us, for example, to build quantum supercomputers, taking say thousand bit quantum machines and coupling them together to make more massive quantum computers. It'll enable new applications as we just discussed. And we believe that a quantum network will also inspire new algorithms with distributed quantum computing nodes connected by these networks. So it'll work both ways, and it's very important that these fields work together, and they're doing that very well right now. Now, what do we need to build it? So I'm an experimental physicist, and this is a wonderful thing to be working on, but what are the components to start assembling a quantum network? Well, we need sources, but sources unlike many of the sources we have today of quantum information. We need a technology that will produce one photon, just one photon on demand as you need them. We need sources of entangled photons, making information and placing in multiple states as you need it. We need ways to detect these individual quanta of matter, one particle at a time. We need atomic scale memories, where we can store the information briefly at the level of individual quanta and extract it when needed. We need quantum transduction. And that's essentially a way of talking about a quantum transformer. How can we turn light into microwaves, microwaves back into light to move information across different technologies? We need to develop the quantum nodes. And of course, we need simulation and control layers. So there's this quantum supply chain that many of us have been thinking about. And again, you'll hear from representatives in industry today who are thinking about pushing this technology to fill out this wish list. Now, I want to just touch base on a couple of these because each one of those in itself is a very interesting research area. So we're going to transmit information using individual photons as carriers of quantum information. And information in that sense is typically encoded in the polarization of that photon, its frequency, or when it arrives in time. And every photon is important for this technology. We can't afford to lose too many of them. So we have to develop schemes to swap entanglement with these photons with repeaters and come up with ways that will be robust to transmit information with respect to loss mechanisms. How do we know in a quantum world if we've made an error? And how does noise actually affect quantum systems? These are simple things to say, but they're quite hard to work out in detail. Now, similarly, I've mentioned a quantum repeater. This is a great example of a technology that's at the interface of fundamental science and engineering. How do we take a quantum signal, read it, amplify it, and repeat it downstream? And to do this at telecom wavelengths, if we're going to use optical fibers. And there are many different schemes emerging to interfere photons, store them, release them using quantum memories. 
And to build this type of quantum repeater architecture, which is a very active field around the world, it will require this list of components to some degree that I just talked about to simply build proof of concept devices that can be scaled to the thousands and thousands that will be needed to have networks of quantum uh, machines. Now, I want to just get a little bit in the weeds with just one slide, so I apologize for the detail here, but I want to give you an, uh, just a taste of, in the real world, how complex it is to do some of these things. So on the right, for example, there have been some recent experiments to use semiconductor technologies that we're comfortable with today and engineer individual atoms in that system and the spins of individual particles to derive single photons on demand. And there's been progress in that using silicon-based materials uh, to generate individual narrow frequency quanta for telecommunications. And on the left is an example of how can you think about converting different wavelengths from visible light to infrared light to take advantage of telecom networks today using one technology and porting it to a different application using nonlinear crystals, using integrated optics, using high-speed electronics, all of these classical technologies being used to manipulate quantum states in materials that are often somewhat different than those we're comfortable with today. So it's a nice example of how you need material science, electrical engineering, physics, computer science, and algorithm development to bring this field to fruition. Now, I've talked a little bit about quantum memories, and this is an interesting area because many different technologies are being brought into thinking about how do you store information in the core of an atom for a length of time appropriate to do network transmission. They're absolutely essential in developing quantum repeaters and quantum networks and different aspects of quantum computing. And clearly you need to store information much longer than the transit time. And people are developing technologies to store this in the core of an atom, the nucleus, in a cavity uh, with photons, simply storing light a little bit longer, building materials such as what I showed you on the left using advanced material synthesis techniques on silicon, a material that we're all comfortable with today, to put individual uh, ions or doped atoms in that material, rare earth ions as an example, to store information for surprisingly long times in a structure that you could integrate, put on a chip, and build in these devices. So there are many candidates emerging. It's really important that all of us you know, embrace uh, with a very open mind what the technology will be from trapped atoms on a chip, to solid state materials, to, uh, to superconducting uh, qubits, all being used and explored as a means to build the framework for this technology. Now, Entangled photon generation, you know, how can we do this even on a chip? And on the left is some very beautiful recent work done by Dirk Englund's group at MIT to show how you can use silicon-based technologies to try and put all of this on a chip, generating light, routing it using silicon technologies, manipulating the wavelengths, and do this in a very low loss way. So I wanted to show you this to say that there's, there's a lot of progress is happening very quickly as we begin to build up this wish list of what we need for quantum systems. And finally, let me mention an area that has been explored extensively for physics and communications technology in general are detectors. That, that might seem a little bit uh, mundane. Is that so important? It's critically important that every photon be efficiently counted. And from areas such as cosmology and astrophysics, people have been developing superconducting technologies to do this in space for years. And they're some of the world's experts at developing these technologies. And we can port that to areas like communication. Whereas one photon hits a very narrow nanometer scale superconductor, it can be seen with extremely high efficiency, very fast, but you need to run at cryogenic temperatures. And these types of technologies are already being used to develop GPS synchronization methods for lower accuracy protocols. So bit by bit, this is happening and what well, we're seeing test beds. There's a test bed here in Chicago that the Department of Energy has funded around Argonne National Laboratory. It's a 52 mile underground network that goes through the suburbs of Chicago. And the idea is that researchers in science and engineering from academia, government labs and industry can bring whatever technology they want to play with into the nodes and explore how will this work in an environment where there are big temperature changes, running underneath highways, 
where over 52 miles, just in the course of a day through temperature changes, the length of this network can change you know, tens of meters over 24 hours. And this is where things like synchronization are so important. But working together with companies that have emerged in the United States, startup and mid-sized companies, now providing rack-mountable sources of entanglement, high-performing detectors, this can be done together as great collaborations between national labs, academia, and industry. So a few months ago at, uh, in Chicago, the Department of Energy announced its plans, as we heard about from the FCC chairman just a little while ago, announcing its blueprint for a national quantum internet, where the concept is to link 17 national laboratories as the backbone of a first-generation system to test secure communications. Think about impacts on science and national security and how we can use this system in ways that, frankly, it's unlikely we're thinking of today, but will certainly emerge in the coming years. But we need to start. So finally, I'd like to end with uh, what we're not alone in this. As I mentioned earlier, this is a global effort. And you look around the world and there are incredibly exciting efforts in the United Kingdom, in Canada, in Europe, in Israel, in Japan, Korea, Russia, Germany, Singapore, India, France. It's fantastic. There are efforts around the world, and there's been a very nice article a couple of years ago about how do we think about a global quantum network? How do we begin to think about standards? How do we think about metrics as we move ahead? So I hope this is a nice introduction for the talks we're about to hear in the panels, how we address these challenges. How well are we positioned in the United States to lead this global field? And perhaps at the end of the day is something a lot of us think about, how will we prepare a quantum ready workforce to be the future quantum engineers of the nation? So thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk to you this morning, and I look forward to hearing uh, the panels in the coming hour. Thank you, David, for setting the stage. That was an excellent talk and laid out the challenges at all different levels. We will take a short uh, three to five minute break. We will return at 9 uh, 10.35 with the first panel. Uh, I think uh, we are just assembling all the speakers, so we will resume in three minutes at uh, 10.35. Thank you, David. Uh, welcome back uh, to the first panel of the forum. Uh, and thanks to uh, Chairman Pai, Commissioner Carr, and Professor Oshalom for some excellent opening remarks and the keynote which did a wonderful job of laying out the basics of uh, quantum theory as it applies to quantum computing as well as quantum networks. We will now proceed to panel one, where we will explore some of the theory and applications of quantum networking. We have four excellent panelists, uh, and we'll start the panel off by asking each of them to tell us a little bit about their work in this space, and we'll follow up those introductions uh, with a question and answer discussion session. So let's get started. Uh, Professor Shoikot Guha, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Monisha. Let me uh, share my screen here. And if you could please let me know if you can see my PowerPoint screen. Uh, do you see my screen? Uh, all right, I'm, uh, I hope you can see my screen. My name is Sekar Guha. I'm the director of the National Science Foundation Center for Quantum Networks. Um, I'm at the University of Arizona. We, we just heard an excellent talk from Professor uh, David Oshalom about quantum networking and the, and the need for the quantum internet and all the opportunities and challenges associated with that. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we are doing in the context of uh, National Science Foundation's uh, effort and pursuit in, the, in this area. So I just got a message that uh, they cannot see my screen. So let me see if uh, if I can unshare and share back. Um, and if you could let me know if, let me see. All right. Uh, can somebody please confirm if you can see my screen? Yep. OK, perfect. Very good. Sorry about that glitch. Uh, so I'm a theorist by training. My expertise is at the background of, uh, is at the intersection of quantum optics and uh, quantum information theory. So I personally, I like, I apply tools from quantum mechanics to find fundamental limits uh, with which information can be acquired, processed, and, uh, and manipulated in the context of a variety of different applications we just heard about. 
uh, this center that I lead, this was uh, recently awarded by the National Science Foundation in the context of their Engineering Research Center program. So these are 10-year programs uh, funded at roughly $50 million or so. Uh, there are nine universities that are part of this center. MIT, Harvard, and uh, Yale University are, are the core partners working with the uh, University of Arizona. And the program uh, includes uh, researchers that span all the way from uh, people working in the material science on, the, on developing new quantum memory technologies, uh, ways to hold that qubit we just heard about um, uh, faithfully over long um, uh, time span so that we can build these quantum repeaters that Professor Ashwalam just mentioned, um, to people who work on photonic engineering, nanophotonic systems, uh, fiber optics technologies, uh, quantum repeater uh, development in uh, error correction codes, and all the way up to computer scientists who are working on designing the network protocol stack. Uh, the entire network protocol stack for, for this quantum upgraded internet to work seamlessly with the classical internet. Uh, so there's a lot of work that spans uh, many, many disciplines. It's a highly, highly uh, interdisciplinary center. And uh, the final, final objective of this whole effort is to get to a point where we can faithfully transfer quantum data from uh, point A to point B, serving multiple parties, multiple applications, and uh, work seamlessly with the classical internet. So the quantum internet, in my opinion, it's not a new internet. It's the, it's the classical internet that we have today upgraded to be able to carry quantum bits, uh, quantum information. So someday we will see applications uh, that go beyond what we just heard about in the previous talk on secure communications and telescopes and so forth. And there will be hopefully a whole new ecosystem of app developers that will develop new, new applications that can benefit from this technology. Uh, so we in this program have four thrusts. Thrust one, uh, look, building the quantum network architecture. Thrust two, building this quantum repeaters systems, which will extend the reach of quantum communication to eventually leading to global scale communications. Thrust three, uh, working on quantum materials, devices, and fundamentals. And something very, very interesting to this particular panel, in thrust four, we have researchers from law, economics, policy, and social behavioral sciences working on uh, uh, understanding and researching long-term societal impacts of, of quantum internet and associated technologies, and what are policy considerations, what are regulatory considerations, and so forth. And we'll be building two test beds. Uh, my colleague, Dork England at MIT and Professor Jeshan Jung at the University of Arizona will be designing two big test beds in Boston and Tucson uh, to test out different technologies. So there are, there's work we will do on fault-tolerant quantum networking, network protocol design, and a lot of host of work in quantum devices, spin photon interfaces, how do photons, um, which are the only type of carrier of quantum bits that can actually fly long distances, how do they interface with the quantum memories that where the qubits actually sit within the confines of the memory at a, at a repeater node or within the confines of your quantum computer. And then there's a host of work on detectors and transducers. So with that, I'm just going to conclude. This is the entire family of all the industry partners, universities, FFRDC partners, incubators, and a variety of international partners working in quantum networking technology that are part of this center. And I'm going to unshare my screen and we'll go to the next speaker. Thank you, Monisha. Uh, thank you, Professor Guha, for that. Um, I don't think we are at the point yet in the development where app app writers are raring to go on quantum networks. But we do have Venkat uh, Josiola from Verizon, who will maybe tell us a little bit about Verizon's latest efforts in this field. Venkat, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Manisha. So Venkat Josiola, I work in the uh, technology and product development organization of Verizon. So uh, playing a specific role on looking at emerging technologies and see how they apply to the business and that drive certain components of that technology, whether within our own uh, contributing to the IP or working with industry partners, universities, and bringing all that together to really uh, take it to market to launch products and services that are meaningful to the customers. So I'm fortunate to work with a diverse uh, team of uh, network architects, software architects, people who have developed large-scale IP networks, MPLS-based networks, cloud platforms, and then we work on a bunch of areas like hyperlocation, computer vision, AI. And as we started to look at 
uh, quantum, I mean, clearly the area of quantum computing where you have these massive computational tasks that you can offload now to a cloud uh, infrastructure. You see quantum compute being available through the cloud providers. So that that is fairly well defined. So you have this you have a large problem, you uh, get some quantum compute, gain some efficiencies over there. Yes, a lot of problems to be solved, but we think of ourselves as a user of quantum compute in that space. When we move to quantum communications and kind of double click on that, that's where the impacts to existing networks, the impacts to security, how do we address those and stay ahead of the curve and also at the same time, look at new opportunities that can arise of uh, some of these capabilities. So as part of that, we started looking at uh, quantum key distribution and we have announced uh, a trial in here in the Washington DC area uh, between two of our locations where uh, we implemented QKD on a single fiber using a different wavelengths. So you, you didn't have a dedicated fiber for the quantum channel and the data channel. So it's a single fiber, different wavelengths, and we were able to also use some standardized ways of retrieving the keys, which is important as you think about operationalizing these networks and using those keys to actually encrypt a video stream between those two locations. So that's where we are starting our journey and going up the stack to enable more applications, trying to address now how do we extend that uh, beyond uh, you know, 70 to 100 kilometers and take advantage of the different components you're hearing about uh, throughout the day, whether it is uh, trusted nodes, quantum repeaters, quantum memory, how do all these things come together so that as we move up that stack to the application layer, we are able to um, package these in terms of services and at the same time, um, you know, make it more efficient for uh, communication overall. Back to you, Manisha, thank you. Thank you, Venkat, and we will uh, delve into some of these questions a little bit more in detail once we go into the discussion session. Uh, Paul, moving on to you, you can give us a little bit uh, of background of your work in the space. Great, thanks very much. So I'm a professor of physics at the University of Illinois. I'm also the director of the Illinois Quantum Information Science and Technology Center, and I'm also the uh, thrust lead for the quantum communication thrust of the new DOE Center, uh, QNEXT, up at Argonne National Laboratory, centered there. So my own research uh, has a couple different aspects. One of them is developing resources for optical quantum information processing. So things like the entangled photon sources and single photon sources David was talking about, detectors, quantum memories, uh, trying to incorporate multiplexing. And maybe I'll just comment a little bit about multiplexing. So that's certainly something that is used a lot in classical communication uh, in order to increase bandwidth and, and rates. And certainly even in the quantum space, you could imagine that sort of um, classical multiplexing where you use different wavelengths and each of them acts like a separate channel for quantum in order to increase the rates. Uh, but one of the things we've been looking at is the possibility of uh, what you might call a quantum multiplexing where you can encode multiple qubits uh, onto a single photon. And the reason that that might be helpful is you can imagine uh, a protocol where you have to have, for example, three qubits have to be successfully transmitted through the channel in order to, to work. And if you encode all of those uh, qubits on separate photons, remember the photons are the precious things, and you have a channel that has a transmission of only 1%, then the chance that all three of them would make it through is only one in a million. Whereas if you can encode, if you can staple all three of the qubits onto a single photon, uh, then the transmission is, is still just the 1%. So there can be a lot of benefits as far as that goes. And so that's one of the things that we've been exploring and protocols that take advantage of that. Um, the other thing that I've spent quite a bit of time on is looking at uh, what we might call wireless quantum communication or free space quantum communication. So certainly much of the uh, quantum internet will be based in fiber networks. There's no question about that. But there are many cases where that's not going to be uh, sufficient. So there are fiber denied environments, for example, going to ships and planes and, and other moving platforms. Uh, there is the last mile problem where maybe you don't have a fiber that's going directly to your recipient. And so going through free space might be a much easier way to do that. Um, there's also the case of, uh, it was mentioned doing distributed quantum sensing. And if you think about, for example, with your cell phone, the, the reason that your camera on your cell phone is useful is that you're able to reconfigure it and point it at whatever you want, not that it's always just pointing at the same thing. So in the same way, having uh, reconfigurable nodes, uh, which is something that might be possible with um, with free space. 
And then finally is uh, connecting long distances. And so uh, we're also working, uh, consulting with NASA on, on a study basically uh, for the so-called Marconi 2.0 project, which is a uh, future NASA-led quantum space mission. And the idea is that we can use uh, satellites as basically a linkage, as a bridge to connect up, for example, uh, metropolitan local area quantum networks and e even over transatlantic or transcontinental distances by using satellites. And, and basically, I think the eventual goal is to really have many things connected to many things. And maybe not an internet of everything. It's not that everything is going to have a quantum mm -hmm. link to it, but certainly more than just, uh, I would say, standard uh, fiber nodes or something like that. So that's one of the things that's interesting. And there are, of course, different trade-offs that come when you're working in free space or when you're working in fibers. And so that's an interesting space to explore and to try and understand what those trade-offs are. And with that, I'll pass it on. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just imagining people receiving a quantum uh, signal in their phones. I guess that's not really going to happen anytime soon. Uh, and that's something we would like to discuss later on as to how you see this quantum link coexist at some point and hands over to maybe a classical link. How does that happen? Our final panelist for this session is uh, Marco Pistoia. He's from JP Morgan. That's not a company that you normally think about when you think about quantum communications, but they've been doing a lot of very interesting work. And I'd uh, invite him to uh, talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Monisha, and thanks for having me here. Uh, so I, um, I lead the uh, Future Lab for Applied Research and Engineering, which is um, uh, JP Morgan Chase's uh, research uh, lab. So uh, quantum computing and quantum uh, communication are our two top research areas. So we're working very closely with uh, the industry, the academia, and uh, um, the reason why a bank is interested in quantum computing or quantum communication, um, going back to what Monisha said, you know, like you wouldn't expect a JP Morgan Chase, a bank, to really uh, do work in this space. But in reality, um, quantum computing uh, lends itself to any problem that has exponential complexity in nature, and uh, many of the uh, problems that uh, uh, characterize the use cases of a bank actually fall into this category. They are extremely complex, so they lend themselves to quantum computing. And in terms of communication, um, of course, like uh, there is nothing more important than security for uh, a bank. So um, we have identified <clears throat> the need for um, bringing our uh, like uh, security infrastructure to the next level, uh, in particular because we know that quantum computing will disrupt uh, uh, public key cryptography. Uh, we definitely are um, looking at quantum resistant uh, algorithms for the short term, but we have a vision that in the long term, uh, the um, future of uh, uh, quantum resistant uh, communication is going to be based on uh, quantum key distribution. So for this reason, we are collaborating already with uh, the Chicago Quantum Exchange, uh, David Ashralom, but also with the uh, QNEXT uh, in general, and uh, um, we are literally working uh, in three different streams at this point when it comes to quantum technology. So uh, quantum communication, as I mentioned, also from, a pers from the perspective of quantum computing, uh, we're looking at building algorithms that are <clears throat> like um, uh, important for the use cases of the bank. So we have uh, uh, published several uh, papers this year since I joined uh, um, JP Morgan Chase in January, uh, and we are um, exploring how quantum computing can actually benefit uh, the financial institution. Uh, and then we're looking at uh, um, also a way to organize uh, like a software engineering perspective, basically. So we, we think that uh, uh, the work that we're doing now, uh, both in quantum communication and in quantum computing, should be done in a way that uh, goes beyond the pure science. So it is definitely scientific, but it should also uh, have a, like a um, we're like looking looking towards like applicability to business in the future. So even when we build our algorithms um, in um, um, in quantum computing, we're doing that in a way that uh, they can be uh, reusable, uh, extensible. Um, they're all uh, written in according to the strictest uh, software engineering principles and so on. So. Um, 
Flair um, has already established several uh, partnerships. We have uh, access to five different uh, quantum computers, uh, IBM, Honeywell, IOQ, uh, Rigetti and D-Wave. The last three I mentioned are coming through AWS uh, bracket. And uh, um, we have collaborations with uh, the Chicago Quantum Exchange, as I mentioned, uh, but also with uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, um, with the Tel Aviv University, University of Waterloo. So it's like a, a real um, research lab at this point with uh, um, um, maybe like the only thing we're not working on might be, say, uh, quantum chemistry, but other than that, we're looking at uh, um, quantum computing for finance, for optimization, for machine learning, as well as uh, quantum uh, secure communication. Thank you. Uh, th thanks. Uh, so now we've heard from uh, the initial statements from all the four panelists. Uh, and I'd like to kick it off. I'll throw out a question there. We've heard a lot, um, you know, in the last few minutes about the world of quantum computing. And Marco talked a lot about the applications of pure computing, which can exist in isolation. You don't necessarily need a network or the internet. So what are some of the... Um, enabling features that a quantum network gets you um, in terms of how it helps computing. Uh, so I guess I'm trying to drill down into what are the commonalities between the devices or the fundamentals that you need for quantum computing to happen uh, and what you need for quantum networking to happen. So whoever wants to take this first. Um, I can jump in, Monisha. Sure. Uh, others can weigh in as well. <clears throat> the, so, the, so, very good question. Uh, uh, quantum computers are good at solving problems that classical computers cannot. I mean, we know examples of problems. There's a whole field on algorithms research that is developing newer and newer algorithms and better things that quantum computers can do. But just like when we were building classical computers, if you take us back to you know when the ENIAC computer was first built, the first digital computer, there was a whole effort uh, soon after that, called the started with the ARPANET program that went on to multiple programs, uh, a succession of phenomenal programs, uh, uh, NSFNet, CSNet, and so forth, that were dedicated to connecting computers, so that computers could talk to one another, um, and uh, that resulted in communication technology and a whole slew of applications that you know were not envisioned during the the, the beginning of those programs. So. So first of all, even in that spirit of connecting different quantum gadgets, being able to have the network be able to support quantum data on the network, that's that's already a very, very important enabling technology that will result in things that we can't, we don't know right now. Uh, we heard about QKD, quantum secure communications, but one of the applications of having a quantum connectivity to quantum computers on the cloud, for example, would be that um, if Say I have quantum connectivity to uh, say Google's quantum computer that we heard about from David. I would be able to send a job to that quantum computer uh, in a way that that computer will compute to the computation I'm paying for, but they will not be in principle be able to know what uh, they computed for me. So this is called blind quantum computing. So this application, this kind of access, secure access to a quantum computer would not be possible otherwise. Uh, quantum connectivity uh, on between computers will also happen within the computer. So when you build multiple processors that can talk to each other to create modular quantum devices, just because you know you don't you cannot construct one computer that can that is that is big enough that it can be hosted in one place, for example. So networking capabilities uh, will be absolutely essential to create the whole ecosystem of quantum um, uh, technologies. So there, then there's a matter of scale, right? So uh, connecting a, a distributed computing nodes, say, within a room over a quantum network is very different from accessing a quantum computer on the cloud. I assume that all of these comp uh, quantum computers that, Marco, you referred to, you know, the IBM and Honeywell and all, the access to these quantum computers today is still classical, right? It's still a classical link. So can you maybe, Paul, or one of the, uh, address some of the issues of scale? Uh, what is it, wh what is different about trying to, you know? So, yeah, so I can just say a, a word about that. So 
uh, as was indicated before, if you want to go over a long distance, because you have loss in a channel, particularly in a fiber channel, you need some sort of quantum repeater. Mm -hmm. And for those to act, for those to operate um, accurately, you need to be able to do error correction on them. And that error correction processor is itself, you can think of as a small quantum processor. So you ask, what are the overlaps between quantum networking and quantum computing? Psychot gave you an application of quantum networks to enable distributed quantum computing and blind quantum computing. But in reality, you also need small quantum processors at each of the nodes in order to in order to go over lengths longer than about 50 miles you need to start putting these intermediate nodes in and so many of the technologies will be similar not not as hard one would one would hope you don't need a full fault tolerant uh, quantum computer at every node in order to do quantum repeaters but you do need to be able to process some number of maybe hundreds you know hundreds of qubits or something like that at any given node in order to enable these links over longer distances Great. Uh, Venkat? Yeah, I, I think I would also uh, like to think about this as uh, preserving state information, right? So, and this is where, uh, to Paul's point, preserving entanglement at, between machines, uh, and it's very highly correlated with the underlying fidelity of the link. So what that means is today, if you think about your existing network stack, you have the physical layer and a lot of the state preservation between whether uh, applications or machines or endpoints is handled at higher layers. Here you're getting it effectively for free, but at the same time, it's very hard to maintain it. But once you maintain it, you get it for free, which means now to it has a lot of impacts to the scaling dimension. It has a lot of impacts to how distributed you can get. So I, I think preserving that state is a key uh, enablement and a key differentiator that you have. Now, what that means is even within your data centers, you have existing protocols and complicated mechanisms to preserve, like say, uh, how do I know what is my primary server and how do I switch to backup? Now, if you're able to maintain or share that state or by entangling those systems, uh, it's much easier, however, solving that problem is uh, technically challenging. But once you've done that, it simplifies a lot of your cluster management techniques, like electing my primary versus backup uh, systems. So there's a lot of applications that are even within the existing cloud infrastructure and data centers that you can uh, bring these technologies to. But uh, so my understanding, again, uh, it's, uh, I, I will admit is limited, is that we don't today have a quantum repeater, is that right? True. Yeah. Okay, so in the absence of a quantum repeater today, uh, what are some of the applications that, when I say today, I mean you know, in the next couple of years, uh, what are some of the network applications or implementations that can happen while we are waiting for this quantum network, quantum repeater to be developed? You still have the notion of trusted nodes, right? So you can protect the node uh, enough so that it, um, you have enough security around it. And when we say a trusted node, this could be a terrestrial device or you can get a satellite or a drone to act as one. So there is a pathway to primarily extend your distances uh, in the context of QKD or secure communications uh, while the developments on quantum repeaters are going on. So, so there is, kind of a migration path to get there as well. Right. And I would say, um, I would like to highlight something that Paul just said about uh, satellite-based links. So that's going to happen much sooner, I think, uh, compared to quantum repeaters. And uh, this Marconi 2.0 program that Paul just talked about that he and I and others have been working with NASA on, this program, if all goes well, flies in the next, the mission flies in the next five years, six years or so, this, this will enable quantum connectivity across thousands of kilometers, which, will take a much longer time to get to with uh, fault tolerant quantum repeaters. On the other hand, I should say though that um, as part of the center that I lead, uh, CQN, um, we have researchers as part of that center, Dirk Engler and Michelle Luke and Marco Lonkar in the Boston area. They have uh, just this year demonstrated the very beginnings of what will become a quantum repeater. So for the first time using a quantum memory and qubits that can be loaded onto a quantum memory and doing what are called asynchronous bell measurements, which we heard briefly about in David Stock he alluded to, that they were able to show quantum data communications over two nodes 
at a fundamentally higher rate than is possible without that repeater node in the middle. So it's not quite yet what I would call a repeater because it doesn't have the full functionalities needed, especially quantum error correction that Paul just mentioned. But uh, we will get there. I mean, I, I think the technology is progressing very rapidly. That's great to hear. Marco, you, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I would like to say that uh, um, like many times when we talk about quantum computing, uh, we use this terminology quantum ready. So it means like mm -hmm. quantum computing is not yet here uh, to solve uh, the real problems that we face every day. But this doesn't mean that uh, we're just sitting back and relax relaxing waiting for quantum computing to become fully operational so we are becoming quantum ready and the same thing applies to uh, to quantum communication so even though we have uh, um, like an issue of uh, like uh, the repeaters then like the repeater technology still has to come in place for us to be able to to do long haul uh, quantum key distribution uh, it, this is still this is already the time to become quantum communication ready so, uh, for example, that's the reason why at JP Morgan Chase we are working in collaboration with uh, um, uh, with our partners at the Chicago Quantum Exchange and so on. The reason is that uh, uh, even even if it's there is only like a, a, an opportunity right now to have uh, to make experiments on QKD on uh, uh, short haul uh, networks, like we're talking about 50 miles or something like that. That's already a, a nice experiment to put in place, it can even become usable as a prototype for, let's say, metropolitan areas uh, where uh, even a bank, you know, having two different branches or two different data centers uh, can uh, put together like a, an infrastructure for an initial proof of concept that will eventually evolve into a much more sophisticated um, solution. Uh, great. Uh, thanks for that, Marco. And uh, th there have been a couple of references uh, over the last few minutes to speeds and data rates. And so what is a reasonable expectation for a performance of a quantum network in terms of throughput? I realize that high throughput is not really the reason today to go for a quantum network or com quantum communications. Uh, but what are some of the limiting factors there and uh, how would that uh, play out? Paul? So one limit is that you, if you have, say, entangled particles, they're really just entangled as a pair and you need to keep them separate from the other ones. So you need to be able to distinguish a particular photon coming in. And our best detectors have maybe a time resolution of something like 10, 10 picoseconds. Uh, so that's uh, 10 to the minus 11 seconds, which is pretty short, but it definitely limits the number of attempts mm -hmm. you can make per second. And you can you can ramp that up a little by using, say, different frequency bands, wavelength bands. So maybe you could do another factor of 10 or 100 on top of that. But that's going to be, I guess that is going to be the upper limit of how fast you can send you know, any quantum information down a channel and being able to resolve it. And then, then you have to take into account the fact that there's loss and inefficiencies in systems, and that's going to drive rates down. So I, I think initially, you know, you can think of something of order of, uh, you know, a, gig, a gigahertz plus or minus a factor of 10 uh, is going to be the upper limit, I think, on what you'll be able to to achieve. And that's that's more or less just limited by laws of physics, not not just technology. Psycho. Um, so uh, good point, Paul, about the detector limitation. So that's um, that's absolutely true. Uh, that detector bandwidth will limit your 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 rate. Uh, but there is one other thing about sending quantum data, which is unique to uh, quantum compared to sending classical data. So we all know about classical data communications. There are two knobs we can turn, right? There is the transmit power and there's the bandwidth. And uh, they both uh, are, are, are knobs that, that affect your, your capacity, that the rate at which you can send the classical data. For quantum communications, you can only turn one of those two knobs. You can turn the bandwidth, which Paul was just alluding to, the the, the deciding factor between the, the source bandwidth and the detector, detector bandwidth and the detector bandwidth is the limiting factor in most cases. But you cannot turn that power knob, unfortunately. So which is why what happens is so once you design your system, if you don't have those repeaters along the way, your communications rate, the, the rate at which you can send qubits faithfully, it fundamentally decays with the loss in the channel. And it decays proportional to the channel's transmissivity, which translates to decaying exponentially with the length of fiber. So this is a big, big limiting factor in quantum communications right now. 
And uh, that limits the range that Paul alluded to that 50 kilometer range. And that basically comes from that, that sort of a consideration. So it won't, unless we build quantum repeaters, we cannot really extend that range. On the other hand, as um, Venkat just mentioned, the if, if QKD were the application we cared about, that was the only thing right. we cared about right now, you could build a longer distance quantum network by constructing these trusted nodes, which are physically secured trusted nodes that can extend the reach, but you cannot support like truly quantum networking applications. You can do QKD on such a network though, which is what China has been has been building. Right, and I think the, the, I, the community, I think pretty much accepts, and we can see that by the things that Verizon and other companies are doing, is that QKD is going to be that first application, but that does not push the data rate envelope. So uh, it's clear that to really push the data rate, so we are not getting to uh, 7G anytime soon using uh, quantum, uh, maybe at some point in the future. But given the limitations that we have today, are there applications other than QKD that make sense to, for companies like Verizon and JP Morgan to start thinking about? Yeah, so for example, um, um, so in, in the area of applications, um, I, I think every, uh, so of course a bank is super uh, uh, concerned about security. There is a, mm -hmm. a huge, enormous amount of uh, infrastructure around security for a bank. Uh, because the data that we deal with is uh, extremely sensitive. It's uh, uh, financial data, data of customers. Uh, you can imagine credit card numbers, social security numbers, uh, and things like that. So um, there, there are uh, several transactions that happen uh, on a daily basis that are extremely uh, sensitive. Um, and uh, um, for this type of transactions, we are already looking at uh, uh, using uh, quantum key distribution. Uh, of course, not now, but that's our goal. So uh, we almost like uh, lo we're looking at uh, partitioning our um, network into like uh, highly sensitive and less sensitive. So for everything that is highly sensitive, ideally we would like to use QKD because of its promise of its promise to be um, unconditionally secure. Uh, for anything that is like uh, sensitive, but uh, um, less than uh, uh, maybe something like uh, transactions on payments and things like that. Uh, for those, uh, we would like to have at the be beginning uh, quantum resistant cryptographic algorithms. So we see that in, in, uh, in the near future, uh, it's impossible to have QKD for everything uh, for several reasons. One is that uh, um, we already know that the repeater technology is not mature enough to allow us to um, extend the, a QKD enabled network over long distances. And also even after that point comes, um, if we have to communicate with a customer and the customer is not QKD enabled, we cannot uh, uh, use the other endpoint for um, uh, quantum key exchange. So uh, uh, I think for, the, uh, for a while we will have a hybrid approach. Uh, in which uh, cer certain types of transactions will take place uh, with the protection of quantum resistant cryptographic algorithms, which are classical algorithms for which no um, uh, quantum algorithm has yet been discovered that can break uh, those cryptographic algorithms. And for anything where uh, QKD is possible, especially where we have a need for it because it's highly confidential, then we will use QKD. Thanks yeah, for that, to, Marco. Venkat, go ahead. Yeah, just, just to kind of expand on the encryption piece, right? So if you think about the processing today, you're actually decrypting any data, performing certain processing on it, and again, re-encrypting it. So you do have vulnerabilities uh, during that time. Uh, with the quantum, you are able to actually perform your computations on the encrypted data itself. So what that means is it now start to enable even multi-party computations where you are able to share data within the privacy boundaries uh, and just gives you another uh, layer of flexibility there now where you know multiple ent entities can act on uh, the private data. Uh, the other area which doesn't get a lot of attention uh, is the quantum random number generation just mm -hmm. because it, it's not 
technologically complex, but it just is under the radar. But when you think about that, uh, that function we have, it's mostly done in software today. You're using that as a basis for a lot of your encryption. Uh, but it it will become a best practice where you're using QRNG uh, based mechanisms to uh, just get your random numbers for different applications. Uh, but again, it, it doesn't get as much attention uh, just because it's not that complex. So. Right. Uh, I wanted to pick up on something that I think a couple of you mentioned, which is about uh, quantum links over satellite or free space versus over fiber. Could you expand on that a little bit as to why one is more uh, suitable or one is more easier to achieve uh, than the other? And I think also the same thing about quantum over RF. I've seen some papers that are trying to explore that avenue. And, uh, you know, that is something that I would like to get a little bit more input from you guys on. Sure. So maybe maybe I can start with this. Mm -hmm. so First of all, let's just say that uh, wireless communication in the quantum space is very different than wireless in the classical space. In the classical space, you just send photons everywhere, basically, and that's why uh, you don't have to be particularly lined up you know, in order to get a signal. You need to make sure there's nothing that's blocking overall the signal, but otherwise there's no particular alignment. Whereas in the quantum case, we could send photons everywhere, but that means this 10 to the 11 that I send, only one out of 10 to the 12 will get to my recipient, so he won't actually see anything. So you really need to do very targeted uh, alignment. So that's one challenge. But the huge advantage is that unlike in fiber where the losses uh, increase exponentially, so the signal drops exponentially as you go through the fiber, uh, in free space it only drops quadratically. And so that means that you can get enormous benefits. So for example, in the Chinese satellite experiment, they estimated when they distributed entanglement over uh, 1,200 kilometers uh, between two base stations, if they had tried to do that through fiber, they would have been uh, poorer by, I think, 10 orders of magnitude or something like that. So the rates can just be much, 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 much higher in a free space application. The downside, of course, is that, you know, if there's a cloud that comes between the satellite and your recipient, then you don't have a signal during that amount of time. Or, and satellites are not overhead, you know, they're, they're sort of temporary in that regard. So there are definitely trade-offs between them. Um, but I think for any kind of long distances like transcontinental, transatlantic, uh, uh, definitely the satellites are going to be pretty much the only option, probably f for at least 20 years, if not, if not going out further than that. Yeah. Right. And so the, the, the problem that you mentioned about satellites, right, that is there in classical communications as well. Um, that's something that we have come up with ways to deal with. Would, would you need different techniques to deal with it in the quantum space? Well, they're, they're similar, but the thing is, in the classical case, again, you can amplify the signal. So right. you, this is what Saika was saying. You have that you have that knob where knob. you can just turn up so that, let's say your classical pulse has 10 to the, 10, has a million photons in it, then you can lose, you can lose all but 10% of them and you still get a lot of photons at your receiver so you can mm -hmm. see it. In the quantum case, you have to do it one photon at a time. And so that means that you are just more susceptible more susceptible to that. So you really want to get your pointing and tracking quite a bit better in the quantum case than you would need to have in the classical case. And, and I would say, Monisha, that 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 uh, no matter what, the um, a satellite assistance to building that future quantum internet will absolutely be necessary. I mean, and I'm an optimist in terms of uh, quantum repeater technology being uh, be, us being able to develop that in the next you know, five five to ten years or so. But even so. If you look at the current quantum memory technologies, most of the leading quantum memories, silicon vacancy color centers, for example, they need pretty uh, demanding uh, cryocooling requirements. Uh, the, the best experiments that have been done, they have been done inside what are called dilution refrigerators that can uh, cool down to you know, tens of millikelvins. And these are quite bulky right now, cost about half a million dollars or so. And I I don't know when we will be able to actually lay fiber cables retrofitted with uh, with quantum repeaters underneath the oceans. I mean that that mm. that that's a much much longer term technology than building a ground based quantum internet. So I I totally support what Paul just said about intercontinental links. And you know who knows what will happen is that after the Marconi 2.0 mission, which will probably launch a single satellite, we will have a whole network of low Earth orbit satellites and maybe in the future. Uh, MEO satellites assisting uh, with the quantum repeater technologies to connect that uh, LEO-based satellite network. So it will be it will play a big role in, the, in building that quantum internet. 
wanted to make a comment about your RF. Um, so one one thing I would say is that really the only form of uh, encoding of the qubit that can really fly long distances is an optical photon. There is really no uh, alternative to that. So uh, the, and the, simply the reason comes from the noise. The thermal noise in RF is much, much uh, higher than optical frequencies. Uh, on the other hand, the leading qubit technologies, especially the superconducting qubits that David mentioned in his talk about Google's quantum computer result, that lives in the RF domain. It's a microwave qubit, but it, it sits inside a microwave resonator. It's a superconducting qubit. Uh, so there has to be technology that talks between the RF qubit and an optical qubit. Um, but it's the optical encoded qubit that will fly long distance. Okay. And that actually is a good connection to my next question, which so I think it's pretty clear that we are not going to flip a switch any day and turn from a classical internet to a quantum internet. So these two architectures will coexist for a fairly long time. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the challenges in this coexistence or are there ar architectural changes in the way we think of the internet today that need to change as we think about uh, a future combination of the two. And uh, Shaikar, you said you're an optimist, but maybe even you don't believe that to, at some day we will only be on a quantum internet. So the classical internet is not going away anytime Absolutely. soon. Absolutely. Classical internet is here to stay. It's not going away. In fact, uh, to me, quantum, this adding this new quantum service to the classical internet is going to put additional burden on the classical internet. It's it will it will put new applications, will bring new applications to us, but it will also put new burden to this classical internet. So uh, I mentioned very briefly in my intro talk about the de developing the protocol stack. So it's it's a very, very challenging goal. There are, there are lots of groups in the world who are working on this. Uh, we all know the classical internet is designed all the way from the physical layer to the network layer to the applications layer in a, in a very intricately designed set of network protocols that that run the internet. Um, and the quantum, when you add this quantum service to the to the internet, you will have to you may have to redesign some of the that protocol stack. We are right now what we were talking about in the last half hour are mostly things in what the networking technologists would call physical layer technology. Right. Sending photons, detecting photons, modulating them, and so forth. But uh, yeah, that co-design exists, that coexistence problem is a very important one that has to be very carefully engineered. So you can also think of uh, the classical internet actually playing, providing the control channel, right? So right. although you have the quantum channel, so it, you'll always almost become a model where you have a classical control channel, a classical data channel and a quantum data channel, right? So. So think of when you had the migration from ATM to IP, uh, slowly you were moving away from the ATM infrastructure. However, now, even between quantum nodes that are connected by quantum channels, you will need a classical channel just for your control and protocol-based traffic. Uh, so how do I uh, you know, define my error rates for my application? What do I need to signal uh, to the uh, end quantum node? All those things will continue to happen on the uh, classical channel. I'm going to ask a very, it might uh, come off as a very basic question, but as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about uh, one of the fundamentals of classical communications in wireless as well as wire is this concept of a repeat request, right? Or a hybrid ARQ where you receive something in error and you retransmit it. Is that concept something that apply, can apply to a quantum uh, link? First, you have to be able to detect the error, right? Because right. when you the big challenge is you're able when you try to measure something, you're destroying that bit. So, uh, so now how do I even track where my entangled qubit is, right? So that's a big uh, challenge first. And then you can once you're able to detect uh, failures, for instance, in the QKD case, yes, it's, you are able to yeah. Say that oh uh, there is an intruder or something and you generate an alert act on it. But in once you get into entanglement, how do I even monitor uh, the end state uh, when when it is lost? So. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I like this question a lot because it leads into a, kind of an answer to your previous question of of how you have to change things. So it's it's great that it's been shown now that you can have quantum signals going through the same classical fibers as as the classical signals. That, for example, Verizon showed that, and other people showed that. That's super great. Um, but 
nevertheless, there are parts of a classical network that you really can't have the quantum signals go through. So for example, in a classical network, you might have places where you detect and then you resend. And that's absolutely not going to be something that you're going to do in the quantum case. You have to preserve those quantum states the entire way. And that's, that might mean that you need in your classical network to do some sort of a routing around something that would normally have done that. I think mm -hmm. the other thing I wanted to say, just because you asked, will we ever have a purely quantum network? You wouldn't want a purely quantum network because of the fact that you gain incredibly in the speed of a classical network by being able to turn up the knob that Psychot was talking, where you can send mm -hmm. you know, a billion photons for one pulse, you can tolerate a lot of loss. In the quantum case, you can't do that. So it's really adding a different capability, not just more of the same, I would say. Yep. Uh, and Monisha, about your ARQ uh, question, and uh, that's a very interesting one, by the way. It, the, um, there is a, so we only briefly talked about quantum error correction, which by the way, will be a very, very important thing we'll have to address when we design and build, build this quantum network. There is a notion of um, error correction and error detection, even in the context of quantum communications. Uh, we are still a little far from actually implementing these error correction codes in real devices, but um, what will likely happen is that uh, there will be um, error correction codes that take a stream of qubits and encode them into a longer stream of qubits, just like we do in classical communications, but those longer stream of qubits will now be will now be entangled. And they will be formed into quantum data packets with a header and a, no, with, with all the all the everything that we do in classical communications. And uh, there will be a notion of uh, detecting an error, whether an error has happened in the quantum data packet. And if that happens, maybe you do ask for retransmission. But the only thing we have to be careful about is that uh, retransmission in classical communications means that you have data in a in a physical record in a memory or in a piece of paper that you can resend. Uh, if a computer there's a buffer, is, basically there's a buffer somewhere, yeah. And in, in in quantum communications, as you know, Paul was talking about earlier, is that there is no notion of copying. So if I am the generator of quantum data, for example, data coming from a sensor or maybe my computer is generating a qubit stream, I unless I'm, that's the my, that my, that's a computation I'm encoding and I can do, do, do that again, I won't be able to copy and keep a record of that before I send. So yes, some notion of ARQ will likely happen, but the, the, that 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 whole protocol stack will, stack will have to be very carefully rethought. So we have about five minutes left, and as I'm listening to you all talk, or the, the main thing that comes into my mind, and we'll probably get into that a little bit more detail in the third panel, but uh, it seems like you need people who are physicists, you need people who are device engineers, you need people who understand network protocols, network architectures. Um, it's something that spans the entire range of expertise that you need from the workforce of tomorrow. Um, so, you know, for people in companies like Marco and Venkat, what, what do you think, uh, you know, academics or government should be doing in this space to make sure that we get people with the right mix of expertise as we tackle this field? Yeah, so I, I would like to say that you're right, Monisha, this is really like a disruptive change in the technology that is affecting um, many industries. Uh, it's also opening up new um, business opportunities, new job opportunities as well. So uh, it is true, for example, by looking at the point of view of, uh, of a bank, um, especially a large bank like JP Morgan Chase, we see that uh, uh, this transition towards quantum communication is extremely complex, uh, especially because it happens at the same time in which um, we need to uh, like uh, uh, kind of like uh, substitute all the uh, uh, old cryptographic uh, algorithms with new cryptographic algorithms and then also apply quantum communication wherever we can. So it's like a major change. It, it involves identifying already at this point uh, all the uh, points in the in the infrastructure that need to be upgraded. Mm -hmm. Those that need to be upgraded with new cryptographic algorithm uh, support and those that need that potentially will become uh, a QKD enabled. Um, and then that also requires um, collaborating with our uh, partners because, for example, um, JP Morgan Chase, as well as all the other uh, companies I can imagine 
we don't like build everything in in house we buy products so we need to be able to uh, communicate with our other uh, partners other our vendors to make sure that they give us technology that is compatible with the new infrastructure so uh, i think it's very important to have uh, this type of collaboration uh, with uh, uh, other industries like this conference today uh, is is very important also because it's it's crucial at this point to uh, be able to um, uh, like uh, uh, sensitize everybody about the fact that we need to be in an open collaboration environment where uh, everybody has to play a role in uh, in the transition to the new technology. Yeah, I think uh, adding on to like the diverse skill set that is needed, uh, you don't have to necessarily throw away all the IP expertise that came along all these years, right? So. I think as we bring together these consortiums and having visibility to the end-to-end -end supply chains, it's important to start thinking about interoperability right, right at the offset, right? So I'll do different, uh, and that leads to standards, and also thinking about what is the equivalent of a TCP IP mm -hmm. stack here mm -hmm. and the right layers of abstraction so that I can provide to the upper layers the right programming pr primitives, because that's when your lot of your innovation in terms of applications will start to come along. And certainly uh, the universities uh, can play a big role in uh, training that talent and uh, put, putting together in the right uh, areas. Uh, so we look, look forward to such collaboration uh, across these uh, different different areas, for sure. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the question of standards because one of the things that has uh, created such an explosion of all of our communications networks, be it wired or wireless, has been the emergence of uh, standard bodies worldwide that coordinate these developments. And uh, any last closing thoughts as to where, you know, what is happening in that space uh, to move uh, this field forward? Or is this just too early now where we are still looking at the basic technologies um, and the standards will maybe come a few years down the line? I think the frameworks are starting to come in place, right? So okay. there are now a lot of uh, research papers on what are my potential layers and how do I approach each of these uh, across different in initiatives uh, around the globe. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's just double clicking on each of those and saying, okay, what do I expose to my upper layer? Uh, and then still drive innovation and progress at each individual layer. So yes, there is uh, progress. I, I think it, it's a normal course of time, whether uh, across different organizations. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with Venkat, it's not too early. It's not okay. too early. We are, we are working on these quantum devices and there are lots of platforms that we are that might actually all exist in that future quantum internet, trapped ion, superconducting, photonic processors, all sorts of things. But uh, we have to start discussing as Venkat was saying, what do we pass on to that upper layer? What is What are those right interfaces? Right. And start designing accordingly. Great, we're out of time and we could have carried on this conversation uh, for a longer time, but we will transition over to the next panel. Thank you all for being here and for sharing your expertise and views on this important topic. Um, and uh, for the audience, we will again take a short break while we get the next panel together uh, back at uh, 11.35. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, hello, everybody, and well, welcome back to the second panel for uh, today's Quantum Network Forum. Uh, my name is Ira Keltz. I'm, I'm with the Office of Engineering and Technology at the FCC, and uh, we'll be moderating the second panel focused on challenges, opportunities, and roadmaps for quantum networking. We have uh, a terrific panel with us this morning. Uh, we've got uh, Duncan Earle from uh, Cubitech, uh, Dirk Englund from MIT, and Kathy Ann Sutterberg from the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, and uh, each uh, uh, have been doing tremendous work in this area. Uh, their bios are online, so you can go read them uh, at your leisure. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I, I will start off and say I am by no means an expert on quantum networking and theoretical physics, but I find this area totally fascinating. And uh, listening to the earlier panels, uh, the, the earlier panel and the introduction, um, yeah, I'm learning more and more about how much I, I really don't know. 
but uh, I am really curious to see uh, from where we are on that theoretical side and uh, trying to move to the more practical means, uh, this panel will explore some of those issues. So with that, uh, I'm going to provide uh, each of our uh, panelists an opportunity to uh, give a little bit of introduction on their, their work and how they see that fitting into the theme of challenges, opportunities, roadmaps going forward. And then we will uh, have a bit of a discussion. So with that, let me turn it over to, uh, to Duncan Earl and uh, you have the floor. Thanks, appreciate that. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Duncan Earl. I'm the president and the CTO of Cubitech. We're a, a company here in California that really builds components that will help drive the emerging uh, quantum internet. So just to, to put some uh, physical components with that, if you're familiar with this, this is an SFP laser that we use with the classical internet. And uh, this allows you to send information over optical fibers. It's ubiquitous today uh, as networks uh, emerge um, and grow. And then this is kind of the latest quantum version of that. And it, it still is pretty simplistic, obviously a lot bigger, but it gives you some idea of, of where we're, we're starting to be uh, with some of this uh, technology. So Cubitech has been building those sources and developing those. We still have a long ways to go before they're, they're really doing everything the community needs, but that process is now, is now starting. And if you Google uh, Cubitech, you'll often find that our name is, is often tied with electrical utilities. And the reason that is, is we're a little bit different from other uh, quantum uh, companies and, and our approach to the quantum internet is a little bit uh, different in that we think electrical utilities and the electrical grid actually is kind of a good model for what the quantum uh, internet might look like in that you've got transmission challenges, you've got up conversion and down conversion. I hope we can have a chance to talk a little bit more about that different approach uh, today. But long story short, we're one of the early companies in developing the technology that'll help drive this emerging quantum internet. And we're very interested in road mapping and uh, coordinated efforts with the community to help develop these early systems. Well, thank, thanks. Thank you, Duncan. That was a good introduction. Uh, so with that, if uh, uh, Dirk England, if uh, you can provide a bit of an introduction, please. Yes, <clears throat> thanks very much. Uh, it's, it's, I want to thank you and the whole panel uh, and everybody else for um, uh, at the FCC for the opportunity to speak to you today about my uh, research um, in quantum networks and more broadly building, trying to build that quantum internet. Uh, so I'm, I'm Doug England. I'm a faculty member uh, in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science uh, at MIT and a principal investigator of uh, the Research Laboratory of Electronics at MIT. Um, I also have a, a, a dual appointment as a senior research scientist with the Department of Brook, uh, with the um, with the DOE's uh, Brookhaven uh, National Laboratory, um, where we are looking at exactly the kinds of challenges that we've been talking about this morning. About how do we build devices, how do we build the architectures, and so on to make this network effect that we think will be possible become possible. So, in particular, my research focuses on developing components that use optics to control and to connect. Uh, quantum memories, uh, and in particular, focusing on distributed quantum computing and quantum networks. It's really kind of go hand to hand. It's like on different sides of, of the same spectrum. And um, over the past years, uh, I want to point this thing out that my my that research actually in my group, thanks to fantastic people in the group, uh, that research has led to the formation of several startups uh, by students and some that I have been uh, involved in forming myself. Um, Light Matter, for example, which develops uh, photonic circuit accelerators for matrix processing, uh, Dust Identity that does supply chain security, uh, Quero Computing more recently. And I mentioned these startups to highlight that in the quantum information technology space, there already is, there are se sectors where uh, entrepreneurship is becoming possible. We already just heard from Duncan as another example. But that is particularly challenging in the quantum networking space. Uh, I have been approached by VCs who wanted to fund us to start a company in quantum networks, but we've declined so far. And the reason is that there is still a tremendous, like there's still a gap to utility uh, that is especially tricky in quantum networks. Uh, you know, you need a minimum scale for a network effect to be realized. That is, 
you need a minimum scale of the number of devices, perhaps the reach of the network, for people to see utility in it. Okay, so you have to bridge that gap. Okay, in a quantum computer, it's perhaps easier because one device is can become useful by itself. Here, we have to do a greater challenge. We have to bridge a bigger gap in quantum networks. So in this particular problem of how do we bridge that gap, I wanted to focus on two uh, challenges in particular in response to the FCC's uh, questions. The first is on materials and devices. So individual quantum memories have been successfully connected by photons at a distance. In particular, uh, researchers at Delft University in Europe um, have uh, and they have uh, shown the ability to create entanglement, uh, non-local quantum correlations at a distance faster than this entanglement decays. That provides a resource of on-demand entanglement. And we heard earlier today in the previous session that it is one of the key uh, goals of this quantum network, of a quantum internet, is to distribute uh, that entanglement as a service. Okay, and so proof of principle has been shown between two such memories. Okay, also in recent work uh, between MIT and Harvard, we have um, shown the utility of a elementary quantum memory in extending the reach of quantum communication beyond what would be possible with photons alone. So we've demonstrated a quantum advantage in communication for the first time this year in work led by Professor Misha Lucan in collaboration with Hongkun Park, Marco Lonka, whom who spoke earlier today, and my team at uh, MIT. And finally, um, you know, we, we, we've learned how to make large numbers of devices. Uh, in a recent paper, we showed that we got um, 128 quantum channels to work on a photonic circuit. OK, so we are at the sort of the scalability threshold. But so far, despite these advances, these fields really are still in at, at, at their infancy. Um, so quantum emitters and materials, they must still be uh, produced by individual research groups and small collaborations. This is still like we're really in the playground compared to where we need to be to make these systems uh, scalable. Uh, moreover, these devices, they're generally inaccessible to the broader community. They lack standardization and sufficiently predictive theoretical modeling tools. So a system builder can't look, what are the specs of that quantum memory? And you know, based on that, how can I build a system out of it? And so finally, I think the development of potentially disruptive new materials um, is held back by a lack of instrumentation that is specifically built for the task. If we look at how modern day integrated circuits are built, we have factories that are devoted to the task of making very high uh, quality, uh, you know, integrated silicon circuits. We don't have that for quantum repeaters, so we need to think bigger, and we need to uh, to to allow that uh, scaling transition to happen. So um, I think we need concerted uh, concerted efforts to bring proof of principle demonstrations that you see around the world already now uh, to the point that we can reliably and scalably make them. Okay, so that I, as a component builder can pass that co component off to a system builder who can put many of them together and operate individual components without you know, several graduate students and postdocs mentoring each component. Right? Um, and we, we can look at history. We can look at you know, the integrated circuit revolution required first in the 1950s, high quality silicon to be made. Then in the 60s and 70s, you had to develop methods to fabricate on that, that required specific fabrication efforts that we don't yet have um, in, in, analogously in, 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 in our, uh, you know, uh, in, in our area. And then finally, in the 1980s with the Moses Foundry, that kind of these devices became accessible to the community who could then invent, build systems and so on. I feel like we have to follow a similar trajectory in our field. That's on devices and materials. Second, on network test beds and technology demonstrators answering that question. Um, you, early, you heard earlier today, Professor Guha is the director of the NSF-funded ERC, Center for Quantum Networks, and I serve as a deputy director for it, where I focus on constructing uh, a quantum repeater network in the Boston area uh, that links MIT main campus in Cambridge with Harvard University, with MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and uh, Raytheon uh, BBN, also in Cambridge. 
So actually getting started on building that network has already transformed the way that we think about how we build devices and how we construct uh, the architecture, right? We're working with uh, participants from networks. We're working with, you know, including theorists who work on, you know, Don Towsley, who works on, you know, who, who works on the, who, who did a lot of foundational work for the, for the first internet. Uh, we're working with Cryostat builders. We're working with telecom companies. We're working with national labs, et cetera, to try to build these fieldable systems. And, um, and I think it's when you build these network test beds, you sort of, solve two things at once. One, you make the device builders think bigger. And two, we start to have a chance to demonstrate a network effect quantum advantage. And I think we need both of these to be able to take that step across that gap uh, to uh, make that new layer of quantum network devices, um, uh, you know, uh, as, a set, as an additional layer on today's classical internet. That's yeah. That's that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Great. Thank thank you. Oh, I find it really interesting to see where we are, where and kind of where we need to get to to get to practical applications. Uh, I, I see that um, uh, Thaddeus Ladd from HR Laboratories was able to join us, so um, I will turn to, uh, to next and let him give a intro to some of his work and some of how he sees. These, uh, these issues playing out. Uh, Thaddeus, please. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, a little ironic that the reason for arriving late was, had to do with network security. Um, <laughs> that is a, uh, a, a major problem facing the uh, 21st century, and uh, it uh, manifests as, as an ability to connect to certain uh, meetings, uh, but uh, has many other problems as you're seeing in the news. And the, uh, the quantum network is possibly one um, component of a series of solutions to improve uh, cybersecurity for the U.S. Um, so uh, try to connect my glitch to the, to the topic at hand that way. Uh, so uh, to introduce myself, um, so like Dirk, uh, uh, I started in this field of, of quantum networks uh, some 15 years ago at Stanford. Um, and at that time, I tried to enter into the question of system engineering. What is a quantum network system actually going to look like? And I would say that 15 years ago, it was very, very premature to do that. Um, we just did not know at that time what was possible in uh, in nanophotonics and and, and uh, quantum dots and, and things like that. Um, but I, I would say that now in, in 2020, um, times have changed. I think the community is is really ready to enter into some some significant system design, uh, and it's and it's just a great time for things like the National Quantum Initiative. Um, to uh, to push this this field forward and uh, and and really uh, a great time for more for more industry involvement. So I work at um, HRL Laboratories, which is a private company, although it focuses a lot on on government contracts. Um, you know, quantum networks are not quite commercial yet, um, but they're also not quite fundamental science. They're they're somewhere in between the two, and so it strikes me as the right kind of uh, uh, the right kind of fit for. Uh, for a place like HRL, also a good fit for, for startups like, like Cubitech, as we heard about. Um, in, in terms of what uh, I find uh, uh, key to this field right now, it really echoes what, what Dirk was saying a, a second ago. Um, uh, in order for a quantum network to become a, a, a really practical and, and deployable um, uh, nationwide technology, we, we have to we have to get its components at the level that, as Dirk was saying, silicon photonics are now, or silicon microelectronics are. So, you know, which fundamental technologies developed at places like MIT or, or Stanford are, are really going to be scalable or, or manufacturable? Um, and how do we assure that, that, that lab demonstrations can be can turn into a, a fabrication process that will allow you to, to make lots of these, these quantum nodes uh, 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 cheaply and, and, and reliably uh, in order to build a, a large scale network. Uh, and then when you make, make a system out of these things, how can we assure that it will actually be uh, uh, better or, or, or faster or somehow superior to classical alternatives at the, at the application scale? So to this end at, uh, at, at HRL as, as our other uh, many other places in the country right now, we're, we're, we're doing some uh, 
fabrication process development and, and cryogenic test of, of nonlinear quantum integrated optics um, to, to support this, this quantum repeater technology and, and paying very close attention to, to, um, to the technologies as they arrive in the globe in order to be, to be ready to, um, to, to turn quantum networks from, from paper to technology for, um, uh, for the country. Well, great. Well, well, thank you for that. And uh, for our, our final uh, panelist, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Ann Sonberg and get uh, more of a uh, government perspective. Uh, she's with the uh, Air Force Research Lab. So, Kathy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to be on the panel today. As you just heard, I'm Kathy Ann Soderberg. I'm a principal research scientist at the Air Force Research Lab. So I'll just start off a little bit to tell you what the Air Force Research Lab is, because I think people are probably less familiar with that. We are the primary scientific research and development center for the Air Force. And our role is really to develop innovative technologies for the future warfighter. There's nine locations across the US. They're called uh, technical directorates. They all have a different focus area. And there's three international sites. And in Rome, New York, I'm part of the information directorate where we focus on quantum networking and quantum computing. Although I will say across AFRL, we have active research in quantum timing, quantum sensing, quantum communications, quantum networking, and quantum computing. And so for our internal quantum networking program, we focus on heterogeneous networks. We have trapped ions, superconducting qubits, and integrated photonic circuits that we're trying to integrate into a single network demonstration. And our push is really toward a tabletop test bed where we can distribute entanglement both across the homogeneous qubit technologies themselves, but also the heterogeneous qubit technologies. So that means to connect you know, one type of memory in a multi-node network demonstration, and then also to be able to, to connect two different types of memory, say, in a, in a network demonstration. Um, and they're all going to be connected by the integrated photonic circuits that we're developing that we'll probably discuss later. And so the goal for this is really to explore what entanglement distribution will be useful for and how it can help the DOD. So we have a very... Um, more fundamental research thrust on this entanglement distribution, but then we also think a lot about how to make these systems smaller and a little bit more robust because eventually these systems are gonna have to be fielded. <clears throat> and so we need them also to work well outside of a very pristine laboratory environment. And so applications that we're interested in are things like novel communication protocols. And also if you have this uh, underlying network, what can you use that platform for? you could probably think to put clocks or some type of sensor on it too and see what does the entanglement give you beyond what the clocks and sensors can do on their own. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy Ann. So I, I think, um, well, we'll start, I'll open up uh, some questions. And what, one of the things I find really interesting is we kind of have members from academia, from private industry and from governments. So I think we can get a very interesting perspective. But you know, to start, and maybe I'll, I'll start where the, the first panel kind of left off, and there were some questions regarding the standards process. And when I think about you know, the theme here with challenges and opportunities, challenges certainly present opportunities, and opportunities then always present more challenges. But, and, and maybe directed more towards, uh, towards um, Duncan and uh, Thaddeus, um, who are you know, in, in private industry and trying to manufacture components. You know, with not having a standards process necessarily in place, that certainly provides um, a certain amount of challenge um, and probably some inherent risk to moving forward, given that as you develop um, and as quantum networking develops and the standards processes start to kick off into higher gear, that may, you know, provide um, or necessitate the need to switch gears a little bit, depending on how those develop. So how do you see what you're doing feeding into a standards process and the standards process feeding back uh, and where the development of all of that is at this point and how that might play out? So, so I'd, I'd love to take a, a crack at that uh, first and it can build off of sort of what I shared uh, in the introduction. So as I mentioned, this, this device here is a commercial product that Cubitech makes. It's a quantum source. It's a post-selected polarization entangled um, source. And we would love to be making hundreds of thousands of these because we know we can make them cheaper and smaller and more reliable. 
But right now, uh, for for uh, developing the specs for that product to target what customers want, it's like trying to hit a, a moving target, right? Like, what's the wavelength? Well, you ask six uh, physicists, you're going to get six different answers depending on what they're working on. What's the bandwidth that they need? Does it need to be pulsed or does it need to be continuous? How does it need to be characterized? What spec needs to be guaranteed? All of that right now is very, very fluid. And so it, it's... Um, it's limiting how much we can commercialize this technology. And I hate to say it, but but probably just to get us started, we're gonna have to get the community together and just make some decisions. <laughs> you know, like this, this is gonna be the wavelength we're gonna focus on. Uh, this is the wavelength that it'll be for quantum memories and the interaction between photons and, and atom-based uh, systems. Uh, we probably have to put a stake in the ground initially uh, with some sort of a standards uh, body. To, to hopefully drive that that component development. Right now, everything is custom, and then it, it, it obviously there's a there's a need for that component, and I wouldn't want to take away that customization or that flexibility. But it would be nice if there were some uh, community defined parameters around at least the the sources. The detectors are a little bit more um, flexible in in terms of you could have high efficiency over a broad range, and there's detectors that could already uh, do that. But definitely for the for the sources, uh, coming up with some standard, at least in the early period, to define our targets uh, would really help to uh, uh, move these technologies, advance them, and mature them for the community. Yeah, I, I would I would like to strongly echo something that that Duncan just said, and that that is the 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 the, the nature of the moving target for the quantum internet right now, because uh, uh, because there's just so many decisions that uh, the community has not made uh, and cannot make. Um, I mean, the you know, will the quantum internet, will it use repeaters or not, or will it use trusted nodes? Very big question. I would think repeaters, but other people may, may disagree. If it does use repeaters, what kind of memory does it use? Does it use memory at the at telecom wavelength or does it use uh, memory that, that interacts with photons at a very different wavelength? Uh, 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 you know, is there going to be multiplexing? Is there not going to be multiplexing? Is there, are you going to use this form of photonic encoding or this other form of photonic encoding? And it's not just that the community hasn't made decisions on those uh, questions. It's that the community is not able to make uh, decisions on those questions because the research results are not sufficiently complete to truly system engineer all the way from the component level uh, to an application level. Um, so it, you know, that's that's the it's it's still the early days of of quantum communication with 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 respect to technology readiness, uh, and until some down selections of components happen, it's very hard to to for anybody, whether they're an industry, a national lab, the government, whatnot, to say, look, it's going to be at this wavelength, and it's going to use this protocol, and it's going to use this form of memory. So now we're going to make standards around that system. So I'd, I'd say overall, it's 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 premature uh, to be making standards for quantum internet. Dirk. Yeah, <clears throat> um, if I can just uh, add to that, uh, to that is this uh, point about should it be repeater based or trusted node based? I wholeheartedly uh, agree with him that it should be based on quantum repeaters. The um, networks based on trusted nodes are very limiting. They basically would exclude many of the applications that we think are going to be um, useful on the quantum internet. So if you then say, okay, it's going to be quantum repeater based, you have to build the first quantum repeater. <laughs> and we have, um, we've just uh, crossed the threshold where we have demonstrated most of it. And we're very, very close, basically in the next months or perhaps year or so to demonstrate a full repeater. Um, but then taking that out of the laboratory and making it reliable and so that it's fieldable um, uh, and to put it to systems, that is a pretty big technological challenge. And it's going to require sort of a rethinking of how we in my community approach these problems. And that's what I was trying to allude to earlier. And in that transition, when technologies are ready, some amount of standardization will become necessary when the time is right. And I think it's soonish. Um, and uh, hopefully that will make it easier to then uh, ensure compatibility with some of the components that, for example, uh, Duncan was talking about. So, so you know, in 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 thinking through that, as you know, you said, if 
if we're kind of thinking along the lines that this is going to be repeater based, um, but we don't yet have a repeater, um, you know, if, if we've demonstrated various portions but haven't quite built one yet, and so we have to get to that point. And given we have a, a, a panel, this mix of as you know, government, academia, and uh, private sector, and you know, it seems to me a lot of the money um, and funding will come right from government sources. A lot of the basic research is coming from you know the, the government labs, from the academic labs, and certainly also from private industry. Um, but then ultimately, will fall on the industry to to kind of build these things. So. How do you see the role of each of these entities, the government, academics, and the private sector kind of getting together to bridge that gap, to get from that laboratory to something we can actually build and, and then sell and kind of get out into the marketplace that, um, you know, this becomes a, a um, you know, a, a technology that starts, you know, delivering applications to, to, to whether it's, uh, you know, individuals, or companies, um, or so. I can I could give one example that I think could be a useful uh, approach, and uh, and that is to commission systems demonstrators, uh, so quantum test pack, whatever you want to call it, user facilities, but uh, system demonstrators that have many of the components sufficiently many so that you can start seeing the actual benefit, this networking benefit, and that in turn is going to force the other participants to work together to set up compatibility standards, perhaps, to make devices more reliable, um, to think about how to manage and control entanglement across networks. So it's a forcing mechanism on the technology, and it also begins to bootstrap some of the industry and bring them in. Because if, if you say this device will have to be replicated a thousand times, okay, so that you can build that demonstrator. You will not want to commission, you will not have want to have individual research groups supply those devices. Some of those research groups, they might work with industry or spin out a startup or whatever to start to supply uh, these components. Much in the way that, for example, uh, some of the other, uh, you know, big science experiments like an LHC or so spawned off new companies to supply those experiments. So that's one thing. The other thing that maybe we can talk about, I don't want to take more time here, but just to kick it off here is, is um, how do you build market-based incentives for transitioning technologies out of the laboratories and into uh, private enterprise? Um, it could be subsidies or something so that you have the market forces, but with some help because they're currently not yet sufficient to take the next step. So if I could just add to uh, what Dirk said there, I mean, I think you really hit the uh, the nail on the head where what we're what we're missing today is that system demonstrator, that partner. And it's not really clear who the right um, entity is or what organization is the right organization to do that. Um, and that's probably the one of the biggest questions we, we have to answer. And there's still some um, uh, question about who that would be. So if you think about, OK, who in the private sector is ultimately going to build, maintain and upgrade a uh, quantum network? Let's call them a quantum service provider. Who's going to do that? It's going to be somebody that has the, the resources and skills that already kind of closely match what a quantum network is going to be. And this is where I know Cubitech, we, we've uh, taken a, a different approach than most. And, and I guess I just want to say on the on the uh, outset of this that our uh, approach is not the mainstream. So so this is uh, uh, maybe 2% of the community uh, is sort of uh, in touch with this approach, but I do want to just throw it out here or socialize it. One of the, the sort of immediate reactions when you think about a quantum internet is, oh, this is just the classical internet, but you know tweaked a, a little bit, still got fibers and we're still sending information around. And that's been the majority of the approaches, but there are other kinds of network systems. The classical internet is an information network, but in this country, we also have a, an electrical power grid that shares electrons around, and that's also a network too, a very different one. How you generate the power that goes onto the electrical grid, uh, how you, you, you don't really have a repeater, so you have to deal with transmission losses. You've got to deal with uh, uh, sort of controlling and balancing that electrical grid. 
It's a very different kind of network. We think of those as kind of two extremes. You've got the electrical grid network here, you have the information internet here, and we actually think a quantum network will lie somewhere in between. When you look at some of the technologies that are being developed for the quantum internet, these are complicated systems that require maintenance. They're, they're uh, really uh, going to be part of uh, uh, almost a machine. As you have users getting quantum information, they're going to be doing something to those qubits and then sending them, them on to other people. They need to sort of uh, be able to reconfigure the network some for, for certain applications. If you think about some of those operations, it does look a little bit more like an electrical power grid. And so one of the things we've done at Cubitech is to try and gauge utilities as that quantum service provider. We're already engaging them for security applications uh, where you use quantum equipment, something called quantum key distribution, to secure um, the, the automation network in electrical utilities. So they're getting already some of this equipment early. If we can then take those same partners and turn them into the early quantum service providers, they can leverage their substations, their trained personnel, their 24-hour maintenance, their fiber optic networks that they've deployed to really get the system uh, running. We need a partner like that, whether it's from telecom or from electrical utilities, we need a partner like that on the private sector to help pull this technology into uh, uh, becoming a reality. So thanks. I'd so, like to add. Go ahead, please. Oh, I was just gonna, yeah, I'd like to add to what, what um, Dirk and Duncan said. I, I agree that we need some type of demonstrator or test bed facility. Um, so we're, we're setting up a test bed in, at AFRL where we'll be able to go from basic research demonstrations to field demonstrations. It kind of has three distinct legs to it. Um, one will be in our, our newly announced Innovare Open Innovation Campus which was built for us to more easily collaborate with our foreign and domestic uh, partners and in industry, where we'll do some of the fundamental demonstrations, which then can feed development into our in-house labs, which tend to be more focused on, on making things smaller and more robust, to feed development out into our test sites, where we could actually test these systems outside of a, a pristine lab. And I think the unique thing about this test bed that we're setting up is it's part in-house research facility for us, the entire test bed, but we'd also like to open it in the future to be part user facility where people can come and plug their technologies in and, in a plug and play fashion, you know, so that will kind of get some of those standards questions starting to be asked because you have to be compatible to plug into the network. So we have to have some form factor that's similar. Um, and then also I think toward the, the the industry side, um, you know, someone brought up the question, how do we kind of encourage industry in this area? You know, the DOD and other government agencies have programs like small business initiatives as well. Um, we just launched one for, for quantum networking. Um, it, was, it was recently announced. And so I think that's another way to kind of foster and help push things along in the community because it's going to take everyone to come together, right? No one institution or agency is going to be able to solve this very, very challenging problem on their own. It's going to take the entire community to come together. Well, thanks. So I, I kind of maybe want to jump back to some of the examples that um, maybe Duncan brought up um, and talking about kind of, again, bridging the gap when we talk about test beds, but also needing more of a commercial type partner to start looking at reality and thinking about the electrical grid. And you know, one of the um, applications we keep hearing first and foremost that quantum networking can do is provide security, well, you know, much, much more secure than anything we can do on the classical internet. So, and, and of you know, one of the other things we always hear about is you know, the electric grid is something we definitely need to secure. So, so in looking at that, you know, what, what are the things we can do or put into place then to kind of start taking those or looking at those applications, um, starting with security and, you know, and, and getting from the lab to these practical, um, you know, practical uses? And, you know, what kind of timeframes um, are we looking at to kind of get there? And then again, you know, what are all the things we still need to put in place? I mean, I think we've heard some of them because we don't quite have all the equipment yet, like repeaters. Um, I'm not sure we necessarily need them to get to the first stage. Um, but, you know, we're, you know, again, how do we get from here to there? So 
I'll, I'll take a first shot at that, and I don't want to take too much time here, but I'll, also I'll make this quick. Um, so I, I think it's a great question, and I truly believe that if you do the security component, if you approach it in the right way, it can definitely be a springboard for um, commercialization of true quantum networks. So when I say approach it in the right way, I, I think we should be doing and, and the federal government should be um, investing in programs to demonstrate um, quantum key distribution or secure quantum uh, networks that are based on an entanglement. So, so you could waste your time a little bit doing security. Uh, it would not be the springboard you would want if you chose a, a certain type of quantum technique. Uh, I apologize, I'm gonna sort of wave my hands on this one and just sort of describe what I, I think the end goal should be. But if you developed an entanglement-based quantum key distribution network, network that was secured by that technique, many of the same technologies that you would need for a more robust quantum network that could be applied to quantum computing would be captured in that. And we see the Chinese trying to do something like that as well. They're trying to use quantum security as a springboard to really build up this quantum market and these quantum components and tools that they can use in computing. We should try and do the same thing here in the US. We just need to be very careful that we, we don't lose sight of the end goal. Uh, security is a stepping stone to this larger quantum network. It isn't the, the end goal, or at least that's what I would, would argue. So, 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 so g g given that, you know, um, you know, starting from that as a springboard, you know, where does everybody see this going? What, what are the applications then that are going to say pile on on top of those, the, the first, if, if, if uh, security is a, the springboard, so to speak? Um, what are the applications? You know, how, how if, if, you know, we were just to kind of throw this out to, to the general public and say, hey, we've, we're building this great new network, it's qu this quantum networking, and we're going to be able to do so many things, you know, greater than what we can do today. You know, how, what, what are the things we would tell them to sell them to say, hey, you know, it, it's, it, this is worth us to, to go down the road, spend money, spend the research. Um, you know, what, what are we going to see come out of this, uh, Dirk? We yeah, so, <clears throat> so just to quickly also just comment on your previous question. Um, I think the uh, NSF, for example, has done a great job in uh, uh, encouraging the community to uh, build first uh, quantum repeater test beds. Uh, the uh, Center for Quantum Networks is a, is a good example of that. There are similar efforts in the, uh, by the Department of Energy. And uh, once again, I think that is the way to prove out some of the components and to um, to help uh, make you know to focus on their reliability and scalability to enable a private enterprise price to really take the next step. Um, the application driver, secure communication could be one, uh, but I think that um, it's not clear to me. For example, quantum computing is a critical example. Uh, if we consider a modern day computer. It has to have a CPU that's talking to memory. It's talking to the internet and so on. It's connected. It's not working in isolation. And for the same reason, uh, when we build a quantum computer, many of the architectures that we um, are thinking about, and maybe all, that uh, could reach the kind of scale where we know that quantum computers can do things that uh, are useful, uh, require some kind of modularity. And the modularity is like what I'm saying here, you know, being able to connect the different kinds of uh, resources, physical resources, memory to processors and so on. Um, you want to have that quantum computer also plug into an internet, ideally. It's just to have a modem. Okay, so this requires this repeater. That's that's what that repeater is doing. It's providing an interface between the quantum computer and another quantum computer to network them or to different components in the quantum internet of things. Um, and so computing is a big thing. Um, uh, that as an application driver, uh, in my view. Security, like we said, uh, quantum communication is just one. There's many other, there's other kinds of uh, uh, protocols that uh, are sort of like security a little bit. The agreement protocols, for example, three-party agreement protocols. Um, sensors is another area um, that uh, could give us uh, better uh, GPS, position navigation timing systems, um, but also to do things that aren't possible I think just let's not only look down on, on, you know, immediate practical commercial applications. Let's also think about what sort of big scientific goals uh, this kind of an internet could enable. Uh, for example, uh, there are proposals out there to make uh, distributed telescopes 
uh, that could allow us to you know, resolve um, exoplanets with far greater resolution than is currently possible. One of the most amazing pictures of 2019, was it 2019, I think, was the, the image of a black hole. Remember that in the news? That was made possible by having networked radio telescopes on the ground that could uh, get the amplitude and the phase of electromagnetic signals. And um, and from and from 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 these observations, reconstruct what uh, what looks like as if you had a giant aperture. If we could do that with optical at optical frequencies, you could resolve stars and planets, uh, you know, hundreds of light years away, with more <laughs> with, with much higher resolution than is currently possible, orders of magnitude. Okay, that's not possible today. We don't know how to do this at optical frequencies. If we had a quantum network, there are applications that have been proposed that could do that kind of thing. So I'm saying, like, look at the commercial things and the practical, immediately practical. But I think some of the big inspirational things for me also are the scientific discoveries that could be made with the quantum internet. Well, thanks. It, uh, it you know, I, I always find this, and, and just like with our communications networks is, you know, the, we built the networks and then the applications kind of came and really made use of, you know, folks figured out what, what can we use these for? And I think what, what I'm hearing, you know, similar to that is, you know, it, it, it's almost just whatever the imagination can come up with. We, um, and even beyond that at this point and, and some applications that, you know, we, we just can't even envision today. And I, I think that it'll, it'll be fascinating to see the way this uh, this does play out over time. So to, to get there though, it, it, it seems that, you know, we, we think about the classical internet today and we have an infrastructure in place and, a um, you know both from how networks are are built and and um, distributed um, and even back to the manufacturing of the components and and whatnot. So how you know how does that infrastructure both from you know the manufacturing process to the distribution to you know just the construction and building how how does that need to change in order to make this practical and um, you know and and what kind of things can we do or start doing today to put that in the place so that when this the research that a lot of you folks are doing as, as it progresses we, we can kind of jump in and not not have a lag um, in, in you know in order to to start seeing these benefits thank you Manisha and others for the opportunity uh, I'd be happy to take a crack at that one uh, if I may I I, I think you know, uh, people have, have brought up the, the test beds that are that are being developed at their various institutions and, and around the country and, and around the world. Um, I think there are three kinds. And if you ask, what do you what what do you have to do in the testing and development stage now to prevent there from being a lag uh, as as the technology progresses? The three kinds of test beds that exist absolutely have to operate in parallel. Right. One kind of test bed is the is the is the laboratory. Very often, it's a cryogenic optics laboratory, um, uh, such as exists at, at, at MIT and HRL and at, at AFRL, et cetera, uh, which is really testing components, you know, nano photonic components, single photon source components, quantum memory components. There's also these kind of um, uh, macro optic uh, uh, test beds that are checking the uh, Fiber networks, right? If you if you uh, you know if you have a box that's generating modulated single photons and you connect that to a fiber network and then it, it gets picked up at the other end, what are all of the engineering challenges on those uh, uh, on those uh, technologies? I think Cubitech is a perfect example of, of a company that's working on those. There's a third kind of test bed which is really um, uh, generating and testing out the interfaces that go between those microscopic components and, and those more macroscopic components and asking, look, how are we going to connect a for perhaps cryogenic memory that's, you know, fabricated the nanometer scale to a fiber uh, uh, connection that at a, at a kilometer uh, or, or, or many mile scale. Um, and these, uh, especially national lab initiatives to, to make these, these networks are an example of, of, of that. Now they all rely on one another. Uh, uh, and it's it's it would be a mistake of the uh, of the community or of the funding agencies to put too much focus on any one of those three types of things. 
uh, while waiting for the others to develop. They all three have to happen uh, uh, in order to, to make sure it all comes together at the end, which is of course one of the big challenges and one of the, the, the uh, fascinating parts of the field is, is, is managing all of those uh, all of those interfaces correctly and in a way thinking about the, uh, the, the, the final system and its, and its deployment. Well, thanks. So, so let, let me maybe ask, ask this uh, as far as related industries, because obviously um, as, you know, industries build, there's all kinds of ancillary industries that can build around it. And one of the things I've heard a couple of times this morning and uh, you just repeated is oh, many of these components need to be, um, you know, kept basically kept the cryogenic type temperatures. So, you know, what what other types of research need to happen in order to make those types of things practical in order to um, you know create these these networks you know and have them broadly based and not just be um, centered in in these labs and government centers um, to in, in in order that we can maybe bring applications to to the masses. But yeah, Dirk. Uh, so Duncan earlier showed uh, one of the products of Cubatech. Um, I think that was cool. It's a, it's assume it's a prototype. You make it in small numbers, I assume. There it is. Um, yeah, we're making these in volumes of, you know, 100 in a year or something like that. Pretty yeah. small. Yeah. So I'm curious to hear what Duncan would say. If, if, if somehow there was a demand for millions of them, you would probably rethink the way that you make them, package them, uh, architect them. You would be able to uh, take investments, uh, make investments into the next generation and then generation after that. And it's, that device is going to become a lot more powerful generation to generation. We see that all the time. Solar cells are showing it, you know, electric cars. Um, if I showed you the prototype that we have in our field for, a, you know, for the device that realized um, a quantum advantage in communication uh, that's sitting at Harvard, it's about, you know, it's, it's, it would take about the size of this room. And it costs about a million dollars to build at MIT. Similarly, mm -hmm. okay, those are we have those that these things have to be uh, moved through several generations of advancements um, so that you can make them feelable. And um, how do you do that? Uh, you know, well, maybe we can look at other technology sectors and see how they have advanced. Uh, electric cars, for example, have had um, have been subsidized so that market forces together with subsidies could advance the technology um, hand in hand, sort of transitioning uh, from one layer to the next um, to make things more powerful and fieldable. And I think a similar uh, requirement is, is uh, we see a similar requirement here for these components, the quantum repeater components. So, uh, so I think working with industry is very important. Some sort of a incentive structure would be very important. Market forces should be there to invite industries to collaborate provide them security to invest, okay, so that tomorrow suddenly the market isn't gone and that all, all the investment that they've put in place has been lost, okay, some sort of a security. Um, and to, uh, I think, to make the research groups think um, about the scale of scaling challenges. Again, when we, when we started this NSF CQN uh, program, um, we rethought our approach because we knew that we had to deliver at least you know, five or 10 of these quantum repeaters. So already that thing that's the right side of this room in our next generation, working with private industry, with Photon Spot, a company that's a participant in this ERC program, it's gonna be about this big, tabletop. Okay, and it's gonna cost about one fifth of the amount of money. Okay, we wanna do that a couple of more generations. Um, and then I think cryogenics, but you know, will not be that difficult. And we don't really know where the temperature is going to end up in. You can get, you know, industry has done an amazing job at miniaturizing cryogenics for infrared cameras, for example, for um, military application things. These are, you know, packages this big that 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 actually work uh, below 100 Kelvin in temperature. Uh, I think it can it can be done here too. Yeah, I would I would comment that uh, although it may seem intimidating to have superconducting nanowire detectors as an example, which uh, like to operate at four Kelvin or even lower, that's not that far off from what has been uh, 
for example, launched into space with an astronomical satellite um, uh, for, for doing a long wavelength infrared imaging. Um, it, you know, it is, it is very, uh, once you have your design in place and once you know what your, what your system looks like, it's not, uh, there's no fundamental problem with making a, a, a deployable, you know, uh, compact four Kelvin system uh, that, that can be deployed into a network and, uh, and um, Photon Spot, Quantum Opus, some of these companies that make superconducting nanowires and photon detectors are also making these, these, these smaller refrigerators in order to make that a more practical kind of detector. Uh, for deployment, so that 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 aspect of the technology is actually less intimidating to me than uh, many of the other aspects of the quantum repeater. So uh, yeah, four Kelvin is cold, but it's it's doable. Well, well, thanks. I know, I know we only have a couple minutes left, and I guess you know, kind of from what I've been hearing, I mean, you know, and again, I find this fascinating. And it sounds, you know, there's a couple of themes that seem to have been repeating, and it, it sounds like kind of if I had to sum things up somewhat. Kind of, uh, a, we need a bit of, uh, you know, or an, a holistic approach that basically takes um, an integration of this basic research on many fronts, um, marrying that with some of the test beds that are currently in place and uh, some of the changes we may need to make in order to put other test beds uh, or or modify those test beds to to, um, to do some of the things we want and get some of the do some of the research and answers, um, which is again a a, a melding of the, the government side with the the academic side, um, and certainly the private sector side, and then getting that to the development um, of of the practical nature of this. Um, so, with that, um, you know, any any last thoughts um, from our panelists? Um, as you know, I think we only have about two or three minutes left. Um, I look for the uh, international quantum coordination office. So Dirk is now right, Very briefly, I, I think I want to just pick pick up on something that you've you know, been saying. Also, this building these uh, insular industries that you mentioned, and, and more broadly the ecosystem. Uh, we really are at a stage where advances on cannot be made in the individual research groups, or even between me and perhaps my other one, two or three collaborators. This is a community effort. Um, it involves Aim Photonics, a foundry that's been tremendously enabling for us, uh, that works with. Yeah, and we work with Kathy Ann, we work with other researchers at Air Force Research Laboratory, Sandia National Laboratory, we work with them on photonic integrated circuits. Um, uh, you know, and private industry like Photon Spot that I mentioned, uh, government uh, incentives and so on. This is a, we need to help build an ecosystem so that we, that will provide, uh, you know, that fill the gap so that we can put components together that work reliably to take the next step. So. Well, great. Just, uh, um, just about out any of the closing. Yeah, Duncan. Just real quick, just to echo that. So uh, demonstrations and uh, product development or commercialization, it drives convergence. And so if we do feel like this field is diverging too much, that's always a, a lever we can pull. Thaddeus, Kathy Ann, any, any other more closing thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I agree with what's been said. You know, it, it is a community effort. And I think as we have test beds coming available and people can actually get on the test beds and try and start some quantum networking things, that will advance the field quickly, much like having quantum computing devices on the cloud, like IBM's machine that they have, has substantially pushed that field forward. So I think the same thing will happen in networking as these test beds and, and demonstrator systems advance. Yeah, if I... If I may have one more, uh, you know, one more thought, it's perhaps a segue to the third panel, which is that, um, it, you know, one 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 thing we addressed is is this is this ready for true commercial development? Uh, you know, maybe not. The application space really, you know, really favors uh, uh, government applications, maybe some big bank applications, uh, but you know, we really need some national unity in bringing in the uh, the, the diverse. Things that need to happen to get to this system, and I'm I'm delighted that a lot of the new funding that uh, from the DOE and from the NSF that are making these these centers are now pushing us in that direction. So I, I look forward to hearing more about that in the third. Well, great. Well, well, thank you, thank you very much. Again, I found the conversation just just fascinating. Um, and with that, I, I want to thank uh, our panelists for a, a really great discussion. 
And uh, with that, um, I, I will sign off for this panel, and I think we'll take a short break and uh, get the next panel uh, panel ready in just a couple of minutes and be back about 11.30, uh, 12.35. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our third panel will be focusing on several policy issues related to the quantum internet. Um, this includes the global landscape, uh, funding, um, as well as workforce, workforce needs. Um, I'm Matthew Pearl. I'm in the Wireless Bureau at the FCC, uh, and I'll be moderating this uh, panel. Um, we have a, a wonderful panel. Um, we have Alex Cronin from the um, Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, at the White House. Um, we also have Tatiana Kerchik who's uh, um, at DARPA, or the Defense Advanced Research Projects a Agency. Um, and, and we have uh, Dominique Dagenet, who is um, at the National Science Foundation. Um, and finally, we have Carol Hawk, um, who's from the Department of Energy. Um, so um, I'd like to start with the global landscape to give our audience a sense of that. Um, and if you could address both quantum research in general um, as well as quantum networks in, in particular, that would be very helpful. Um, so um, perhaps, you know, start with the rest of the world, describe sort of the major efforts, um, and then um, give us a little context about where the U.S. is right now vis-a-vis uh, -vis those, uh, those other efforts in other countries or regions. Well, this is Alex Cronin from OSTP. Shall I start? That'd be great, Alex. Great. I'd like to first uh, explain a bit more about the, the United States variety of R&D and funding activities and, and say hello from Office of Science and Technology Policy. And thank you for highlighting the website, quantum.gov. The office where I work in OSTP, the National Quantum Coordination Office, developed this website <clears throat> to fulfill some responsibilities legislated by the National Quantum Initiative Act. It communicates broadly about QIS and engineering research and development by showcasing activities all across the US government. So quantum.gov highlights centers, institutes, consortia that are established by federal agencies to make the NQI successful in this country. It also provides links to federally funded workshop reports, <clears throat> insights from QIS experts at universities, colleges, national laboratories and industry um, and this includes some of the professors and professionals that you have heard from today. It also includes colleagues from federal agencies. Uh, so I'll go on a bit and explain more about how quantum.gov uh, and how U.S. government coordination works. Uh, quantum.gov really showcases coordination, and coordination is, is really important because science funding in the United States is quite distributed. Uh, for example, over a dozen federal agencies are investing in QIS. And I would like to emphasize that's a good model for the nation because each federal agency has its own mission and its own funding methods. Uh, so that's a strength of the United States in comparison to uh, several other approaches to science funding. And this federated model, it lets us explore quantum networking, for example, with a variety of approaches and resources. So how does this coordination happen? Uh, coordination is accomplished in several ways. The White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and Office of Management and Budget play key roles. Uh, the National Science and Technology Council also prepares strategies for accomplishing, accomplishing R&D goals for multiple topics. And, and so the NSTC, it's organized with committees, subcommittees, and working groups that convene representatives from all different federal agencies to coordinate strategies. Uh, and so now I'll, I'll um, get closer to our topic for this forum, the uh, QIS and quantum networking in particular. Um, so the NSTC has a subcommittee on quantum information science with representation from over 13 federal agencies. And that subcommittee produced the national strategic overview for QIS. Policy recommendations in that document emphasize six points. Fundamental science, 
workforce development, industry, infrastructure, economic and security implications, and international cooperation. That document was released in 2018, and it is well known for articulating a science-first approach to QIS policy, and that's really a distinguishing characteristic of the United States approach to this area. But you can find that document on quantum.gov, along with the Quantum Frontiers Report and a Strategic Vision for America's Quantum Networks. Those two documents uh, also help to further coordinate government efforts. And now to get even more uh, specific to this topic, the NSTC Subcommittee on QIS has several working groups, including one interagency working group that looks particularly at quantum networking. And two findings from this working group that you've heard echoed today at the FCC forum uh, are that new applications for quantum networks will likely be discovered over the next decade because entanglement is a profound physical resource that researchers all around the world are just beginning to exploit. And the second is that we currently need to develop the foundational hardware components, interconnects, and protocols to realize useful applications. Uh, so in conclusion, for my opening remarks here, uh, for both components and applications, we understand that maintaining significant and sustained research efforts with new and ongoing funding opportunities coordinated all across the United States government will provide a knowledge base that can enable revolutionary advances in areas including computing, sensing, and communication. Uh, over to you. Um, th thank you, Alex. That was um, very helpful. Um, it, you you referred to this a bit, but I, I'm wondering if someone could give us a sense of um, sort of um, wh what other countries and, and regions are also focused on this, um, and perhaps in, in addition to what Alex said, just sort of what are potentially some of the, the differences between their approaches and the approach in the U.S. that Alex described? Uh, Alex, could you take that one as well? Sure. They're, they're uh, collaborating and coordinated efforts all across the globe, uh, the, the U.K., Australia, European Union, Union um, to name just a few and the exciting developments in the discovery of QAS approaches and technologies are at such an early stage that we really need to keep open science approaches that respect the, the rigorous and fair uh, interactions that are characterized by the academic community and having people and ideas uh, freely exchanged can benefit all of us in this area. So, so if I'm hearing you correctly, Alex, um, and, and tell me if I'm, I'm not, um, part of what you're saying is that particularly at the level of basic science, we need to be taking a collaborative approach instead of treating this as sort of an arms race uh, internationally? That is correct. It's too early to uh, put up barriers. This is a time for fundamental science. Um, and um, in terms of here in the U.S., I know there's been some some discussion of um, of some of the applications um, that, that may be coming. Um, I, I was just wondering if if Alex or perhaps one of the other panelists could give us a sense of sort of what are the stakes involved here as we look a little further out um, for for countries that um, are able to um, really have uh, quantum networking and quantum computing take off. Um, what are some of the benefits that, that you see um, 10 and 20 and 30 years out potentially? Um, I can speak for uh, the way that the Department of Energy is uh, working in this domain, um, pivoting off of the really important points that Alex was making um, in terms of the importance of coordination across federal agencies. Um, First, though, I want to thank you for the opportunity to join this discussion today. It's a particularly exciting time to be working in quantum information science. The Department of Energy is engaged in many aspects of quantum information science, in fact, um, to the point that Alex was making, and including quantum communication and quantum networks. And in fact, the quantum information science research domain directly aligns with the Department of Energy Agency mission which is to ensure America's security and prosperity by addressing its energy, 
environmental and nuclear challenges through transformative science and technology solutions. And so when Alice is talking about looking toward the future of what quantum networking and quantum information and science may bring to us, the most important applications may still await discovery. Right? We know right now that there are very motivating reasons to pursue this area of research. What, lays, what uh, awaits us in the future could be even more exciting. And so it, as we've heard throughout today already, quantum technology is indeed transformative and is likely to bring solutions that are not attainable through classical means. That was made clear in the previous two panels. So I, I sit within the Department of Energy Office of Science in Advanced Scientific Computing Research, or OSCAR, which is one of six offices of science programs that together cover a wide technical breadth. And we found that quantum information science crosses the full range of domains stewarded um, within the Department of Energy um, Science endeavor. So um, basic research in quantum information science is part of a self-reinforcing ecosystem. Uh, we engage in basic research to advance QIS across the Office of Science so we can in turn use pioneering quantum technologies such as quantum sensing, measurement, simulation, and communication to accelerate scientific discovery within our emission space. And you'll find, of course, that each of the federal agencies has a mission and is working within the quantum information science space in order to um, in order to advance that mission and there's really good reasons why um, so the idea of uh, accelerating scientific discovery within QIS really resonates with the Department of Energy Office of Science mission uh, which is to deliver scientific um, scientific dis discoveries and major scientific tools to transform our understanding of nature and advance the energy, economic, and national security of the United States, which directly supports, of course, the larger Department of Energy mission through targeted research and world-class scientific infrastructure. And, and so that actually brings up the consideration of how do we prioritize the research and we've had some discussion in the last few minutes about collaboration across agencies, so the coordination that is really important for this. Um, and so how do we decide what research to target to best support our agency's mission? And the answer to that, again, is coordination and most importantly, through extensive community input. So as was mentioned this morning also, um, earlier this year in February, we brought together stakeholders from government national laboratories, university, and industry at the Department of Energy's Quantum Internet Blueprint Workshop to prioritize research objectives and identify milestones that we must encounter along the way to our nation's quantum internet. And those milestones, again, will mark um, the applications that we're discussing right now in terms of what will this domain bring us as we invest our efforts in it. And so in, in, in short, the, the workshop participants developed the Quantum Internet Blueprint re Report that was released this year. It's entitled From Long Distance Entanglement to Building a Nationwide Quantum Internet. And the report identifies four priority research objectives and five milestones to accelerate development of our nation's quantum internet. And as a note, referring back to a point that Alex made, is that um, the, on the that this report, the, the blueprint report, can be found on that quantum.gov website, which is a fantastic resource for strategic documents that are helping the community together as we guide our way um, through the effort to create and to advance uh, quantum informa information science and networking. The, to briefly summarize these research priorities and uh, milestones. The, uh, the Blueprint Report calls for accelerated development of quantum network devices, foundational building blocks of the quantum internet, like quantum repeaters that use entanglement to extend the range of quantum networks that have also been the subject of discussion this morning. And the fundamental, the foundational building blocks will then come together, be brought together to create reliable multi-hop networks that control the route of flying qubits and correct for errors. 
And the blueprint offers five milestones that stage development of an emerging quantum internet with increasing capability. The first milestone lays the groundwork for the remaining four by highlighting the need to establish a cross-cutting, multidisciplinary, multi-institutional ecosystem, which again emphasizes the need for coordination. Uh, the next four milestones transition through well-defined stages of development. First, networks that prepare and measure flying qubits without using entanglement, followed by networks that use entanglement distribution to expand citywide, then entanglement swapping to access intercity ranges, and ultimately networks that use quantum repeaters to reach interstate and continental scale distances. And uh, just again to reemphasize that community input is essential to develop a strategic blueprint like this and you know, throughout the community, and I know all of my colleagues on this panel are doing the same, and we continue to work to strengthen and expand the quantum information science community. And, and as one example, this year, the Department of Energy established five quantum information science research centers, uh, awarding $625 million over five years to Argonne, Brookhaven, Fermi, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories subject to appropriations. Um, so these QIS centers are each large collaborative research teams that engage in academia, industry, and national laboratories and bring together multidisciplinary expertise across diverse scientific and engineering domains. Again, that coordination is critical. And the scope of these centers builds on extensive community-wide inputs from the technical scope to the partnership model to the management construct. And, and again, and once again, referencing the point that I also referred to is that the National Quantum Initiative Act, um, which is a cornerstone of this community, it called upon the Department of Energy to establish these centers, and they're certain to accelerate scientific discovery in the QIS domain and in so doing advance DOE agency mission science. And so it is not now known what the most amazing capability that this domain is, you know, will produce. Right now, we definitely have motivation to pursue this area of research. And as we do so, we'll discover even further motivation. Um, it awaits us in the future. And so I, I'm going to turn the conversation back um, to my panelist colleagues. Um, now. Yes. So, so that was very helpful, Carol. And I'm wondering because you know several times you emphasize sort of the importance of community input. Um, and so I'd, I'd open it up to the other panelists as well, um, just to talk about um, how do you get that community input and how do you get it from all of the different sort of areas out there, whether it's startups, um, larger companies, colleges and universities, um, and so on. How do you do that? Obviously, you can talk about funding. Um, you can talk about consultation, but but sort of talk about how you do that and gather that input in a very robust um, way. So, D Dominique, do you want to uh, take that, or, or perhaps sure, Tatsu? sure, I'll try and do that. So, I, I think the way NSF has done uh, this is uh, to grow from the fundamental science that it has been uh, investing on for over 40 years and counting that was mostly uh, relying on fundamental physicists uh, working in academic labs uh, and realized that in order to advance the field faster uh, and further towards application it needed to uh, build capacity across disciplines so there's several uh, programs that NSF put in place for that purpose. Uh, one of them has been um, based on a program at NSF that's called uh, Emerging Frontiers in Research and Innovation that is led by the Engineering Directorate and it funded a program called EFRI Acquire specifically focused on developing uh, and uh, researching some of the major challenges in quantum networking and uh, quantum communication. Then nine teams were awarded that and uh, 
some of them actually were previous speakers in some previous panels. And uh, for example, Dirk uh, mentioned uh, the uh, demonstration of uh, what is uh, the first uh, or the beginning of what could be a quantum memory uh, at uh, Harvard uh, with uh, Lukin and uh, Lankar, which was part of that program. And uh, uh, additionally, uh, we uh, realized that the community had to work across disciplines. So it was very important to have both the research and the education strengthened to allow the advancement of the field. So for uh, working across the disciplines, we had uh, specific programs that we required small cross-disciplinary teams to work on specific challenge that was uh, associated with quantum uh, information science and engineering, and it was very broad. The topics came from the community, uh, and as usual with all uh, NSF uh, programs, they went through peer reviews and the top uh, ideas were selected and funded. In addition to that, we uh, had a quantum workforce development that looked at the means to bring new uh, generations of uh, scientists and engineers into the realm of uh, quantum information science through summer schools, through a program that we call Triplet, which allowed a student to intern in uh, either a government lab or national lab or a private sector. And we had faculty fellows that were offered for computer science, which needed to come on board for some of the critical uh, developments that require computer science expertise. And we have a program that we call Q2 Work, which is educating uh, the next generation of scientists from K to 12 upwards, undergraduate, graduate, uh, and, and beyond. And in addition to that, uh, in parallel to what uh, Carol was talking about, uh, and in response to the NQI Act as well, we uh, put out what we call challenge institutes, which are uh, centers of excellence in the area of quantum information science. We founded three last year's uh, last year uh, we have a competition ongoing this year to fund a few more we also funded a quantum foundry uh, based in uc santa barbara in this case uh, as quantum materials is one of the very critical aspects that is needed to advance the field uh, we have this engineering research center that uh, we heard in uh, uh, the first panel uh, led by Saikat Guha, the University of uh, Arizona, which specifically focuses on uh, uh, quantum uh, networking. Uh, and uh, in all those centers, we ask for cross-disciplinary, we ask for partnership uh, across the sectors, which means partnership with uh, other entities uh, uh, in the government as well in the private sector in the specific case of the engineering research center uh, strong partnership with uh, industry uh, is also a requirement all those centers are actually uh, required uh, and have voluntarily offered to collaborate uh, between each other as well, because they all understand that in order to advance this very complex field, that is uh, whatever this quantum internet is going to be, and nobody really knows what it's going to look like, it will require all the different parties to know, communicate, and uh, collaborate with each other to make it happen. Great, that's very helpful, Dominique. I don't know, um, Tatiana, do you want to um, say maybe some of the ways in which um, what you're doing at DARPA is maybe similar or different from uh, what Dominique has uh, described? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, first of all, I want to I want to thank for for the, this opportunity. Um, I've really enjoyed the previous panels and the whole event. I feel like I've learned quite a bit from um, a really excellent panelists. Um, and uh, so, so I am uh, at DARPA, and I, uh, uh, I've been uh, uh, at DARPA for two years now. Um, but I've been working in the field of quantum information science for for over twenty years, mostly with the Department of Defense on the funding side of things. And that's a little different from perhaps um, other other agencies uh, and departments. Um, for one thing, um, uh, Department of Defense. Uh, um, 
is uh, motivated primarily by national security uh, missions, of course. Um, uh, but also it's been involved in in supporting quantum information uh, research from really early days, uh, mid 90s or so. Uh, and DARPA in particular had uh, um, a number of pioneering programs 15, 20 years ago in quantum computing, quantum, quantum networks, uh, quantum sensing. Um, and DARPA stays active in, in this area. Currently we have um, uh, programs uh, uh, mostly in uh, quantum computing. I have a program with uh, 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 quantum computing with the NISC devices, no noisy intermediate scale quantum devices, uh, looking at the utility of those uh, and whether we can have some um, uh, applications um, before we have fault tolerant, full blown universal quantum computers. But also um, over the decades, Department of Defense, of course, uh, including DARPA, is uh, has been interested in in utility of quantum sensing and and clocks and things like that. And there's a lot of a lot of progress there. So that's a little less relevant to to this discussion, perhaps. But um, uh, but it does become relevant when you're talking, as as Dirk pointed out. Uh, we still don't know what the potential benefits of a of a quantum network. Um, are going to be, or what the biggest benefits are going to be, right? Um, however, what we do know uh, is that, and I, I personally don't work right now directly in the area of quantum networks, so I, I probably have more <laughs> questions than answers at this point. But what we do know, what is clear, is that um, quantum entanglement is a, is a really, really new and different, unique physical resource that uh, is now available to us. And in fact, when I say now, I mean for the past couple of decades, right? Um, uh, and um, um, and we know that that quantum entanglement is a, entanglement is a uniquely quantum resource, right? Uh, and that's what's behind the power of quantum computing, for example. It's really the entanglement. So um, in the context of networks, you can now, um, uh, it doesn't take too much imagination to to kind of um, see that if you have entanglement in a distributed configuration in a network, that uh, it would be a very, very powerful, potentially uh, physical resource to use for different kinds of applications, not only communication, but, um, you know, perhaps sensing uh, and uh, and other things. And I like the, the example that the Dirk mentioned, um, in the classical world where we uh, utilize classical uh, correlations like coherence to, for example, image better. He, he uh, mentioned the example of the, the recent image of a black hole. Uh, so if you have an array of coherent imagers, right, you can uh, get a benefit from having an array versus, versus having one. Um, and of course, uh, in in radio astronomy, this is this is everybody knows this, uh, the 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 large uh, large array there um, um, that behaves just like if you had a, a huge enormous one telescope, right? So arrays and distributed uh, sensing is is uh, is uh, is uh, is, a, is a useful thing in the classical world as well. So now. Uh, quantum correlations like entanglements are much stronger, deeper, and more powerful than classical correlations. So it's not a um, far-fetched, uh, perhaps, assertion that if we could have distributed entanglement in a network, that it would really um, form a basis for applications that we perhaps can't even, you know, think of right now. So that is one. Uh, to me, that's that's. Uh, the most exciting thing about quantum network, frankly, um, but it remains to be really proven and seen um, how how well it works and and uh, what we can uh, truly get out of it. Um, so again, that's my personal opinion on 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 that topic. Um, and and I'm also wondering there have been sort of throughout the day several um, comparisons that have been made between DARPA's role um, with with the ARPANET, uh, which eventually resulted in the internet, um, with some of the work that's being done here. So I'm wondering if you um, uh, or perhaps Alex or someone else has any thoughts on sort of what are the lessons learned from that experience um, that might be applicable um, to quantum networking. 
I can uh, respond. Uh, so I liked the comments I heard earlier today in this forum about the ecosystem and the community effort necessary to accelerate exploration and demonstration. Uh, these dovetail with the inspirational notion from Vannevar Bush that investments in fundamental research lay the foundation for the nation's prosperity and security for decades to come. And, and so as mentioned, we should create the knowledge base in order to understand how and understand why to build out quantum networking uh, with various architectures and approaches. Uh, supporting that, I'd like to call out a couple other uh, activities, which you may be aware of. The Quantum Economic Development Consortium, QEDC, is an industry-led consortium established by NIST to support pre-competitive research on standards and supply chains for quantum information science technologies. Supply chains are international, and so that's something we know, and, and we need to uh, carefully develop best practices to maintain access to and produce the best components. Um, standards and roadmaps can accelerate research, but care should be exercised so that we do not preclude, as Carol said, some use cases that have not yet been invented. Another item that's uh, connected to these thoughts I'd like to mention the Tokyo Statement on Quantum Cooperation. This was uh, developed by the U.S. Department of State and counterparts in Japan, and you can see a link to it on quantum.gov. And I'll just read uh, a, a paragraph or a bullet point from that statement. Acknowledging that international partnerships are key to combine the expertise, ingenuity, and creativity of our countries to expand our fundamental understanding of QIS technologies and thereby accelerate the realization of new technologies for the benefit of humanity, we, signed below, intend to harness the spirit of science, technology, and innovation to pursue cooperation and the mutual respect it confers and to promote QIST, including but not limited to quantum computing, quantum networking, and quantum sensing, which underpins the development of society and industry. So, you know, that's an example of something that OSTP played a role in helping to develop. And then since you mentioned the global landscape and international activities, in addition to the um, high level research collaborations, uh, I'd also like to talk about education and workforce development, which is really a global issue. Another item that you can see a link to on quantum.gov is the national Q12 Education Partnership, and this is an endeavor to create more curriculum and resources for educators to expand access uh, in the K through 12 pre-college uh, education system to create new learning tools that will inspire the next generation of quantum leaders. And, and that's a, an easy place where we can see benefits that cross uh, from QIS into all branches of STEM and a very international opportunity there to improve our educational system for preparing uh, people to enter fields like QIS. Thanks. Um, great, thank you, Alex. And that, that provides us with a really nice segue um, into our next topic, which is on workforce needs. Um, and um, you talked a little bit about that resource on, on K.12. I'm wondering if you or others have thoughts about more at the college and university level um, what we need to be doing to attract the brightest young minds to work in this area. Um, yeah. And um, also, is it, do they need to study quantum networking specifically as part of a program? Um, or is this something that you <coughs> would recommend or see them cobbling together from a variety of different um, fields? Um. Yeah, I can uh, make some remarks on that regarding what Department of Energy is engaged in. Um, the workforce development is, of course, absolutely essential, as um, Dominique and Alex have pointed out. Um, and Alex referred to the NSTC, and we participated in a working group on QIS workforce development associated with that council. And also the DOE QIS centers um, have a multifaceted approach to workforce development. They're going to be engaging in summer schools, 
providing internships with industry partners, training opportunities with the Department of Energy National Laboratories, curriculum development in collaboration with other agencies and industry, um, which goes to the point of the importance of the cross-pollination. It is a very multidisciplinary area, and we need to bring folks from many different areas of expertise together um, to accomplish the goals that we have set um, with, through our strategic documents. Um, that's really important. And then um, Alex also mentioned the QEDC, the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, which brings a lot to the table here. And so the QEDC was established through the National Quantum Initiative Act as well, and that called for NIST or the National Institute of Standards to uh, standards and technology to create this consortium of stakeholders um, intended. And the consortium is working to identify gaps that are needed to be filled in order to create and sustain a quantum technology industry in the United States. And this um, th this obviously brings in workforce. Um, there's several tech technical advisor committees that the QEDC supports or ha has um, established. Um, and they include use case development. So thinking about what is the next amazing uh, technology that will come to fruition through this research domain. Enabling technologies was discussed in the earlier panels today, for instance, cryogenic um, capabilities. So what are the enabling technologies that need to be developed to support quantum networking and QIS on activities? Uh, standards and performance metrics. Uh, as we go forward in order to develop technologies that then can be transitioned to the marketplace, um, there needs to be an interoperability um, and then developing kind of baseline um, performance metrics can provide for that. And then workforce development is also one of the technical advisory committees um, that the QEDC has established. And uh, it, it's a public-private partnership. There's representatives from industry and government on the governing board. And at this time, DOE and NIST are, are, have two places on that governing board, and I'm um, the DOE representative for it. So just uh, it, the QEDC touches on many aspects of the conversation that we've been having today, including workforce development. Um, Tatiana or Dominique, do you have any additional thoughts on this workforce development issue? Yeah, I'll be glad to add a couple of points to uh, the, the very good points that Carol already made. I think one of the things that is, uh, that's been a challenge in order to advance the field is again the fact that uh, the research it has to be really very much cross-disciplinary. And so we at NSF realized that it was important to ensure that uh, the uh, hiring uh, at the, in the private sector would be possible with students who have had the appropriate uh, training. Uh, so that's why we put together uh, some uh, possibilities of uh, internships for the students to actually understand beyond their classes what actually happens in a lab uh, in the private sector or in uh, other uh, laboratories uh, outside of academia but also the fact that there are some uh, communities that are clearly more mature than others physics has been teaching uh, quantum information science forever uh, if you look at the uh, quantum uh, computer scientists there's very few of those and uh, there's a clear need to encourage those departments. Similarly, in uh, electrical engineering, uh, there's needs to encourage uh, those universities to develop uh, curricula for uh, this uh, area for quantum information science. And so we have been working very hard to try and do that. And of course, in order for this to happen, you need to uh, start at the lower level of the pipeline to get kids in school, to get teachers educated, be it at the secondary school or at the college level or community colleges also because you need technicians who will be 
maybe working on classical aspects uh, of tools that will be used for quantum applications and they need to understand also what uh, quantum information science is. So there is a very broad uh, need for uh, workforce development and education that happens at many, many levels. And I think uh, one of the ways that uh, we have been uh, promoting that in addition to specific programs on education and uh, training and uh, internship is also to require that all our centers have a strong program in the area of education and in the area of outreach because we want to make sure that we diversify our uh, workforce as well so we can go and outreach into the community for those young minds who would be excited about this new field and want to actually learn about it. And we want to give them the possibility to do that, to find courses that they can uh, that they can go into and to find the teachers who are able to educate them and direct them into the right direction to actually move into the next generation of uh, quantum scientists. Um, thank you, Dominique. Those were really um, helpful thoughts. Um, you you spoke a bit about sort of improving the the lower end of the pipeline, um, and I'm also I'm also curious about sort of a little far, further down the pipeline um, for sort of mid career people. If you're an electrical engineer or you're a computer scientist um, and you're interested in this, um, would it be feasible for someone who is had the talent and the interest to get into quantum computing? And if so, how would they go about doing it? Yes, yeah, so that's a very good point. We have uh, several of our uh, challenge institutes who actually are developing courses to retrain the workforce in the private sector people who have been trained classically, but will be asked or are being asked to work in the area of uh, quantum information science and need training. And so we have uh, specific courses that are uh, currently being developed for that very, uh, very need. And indeed it is uh, something that is critical. I can echo that answer if I may. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you've asked about workforce development, and I agree with uh, all the comments that have been made, uh, indicating that uh, workforce development for QIS is about getting more people involved and breaking down barriers and understanding a wide variety of useful skills. And some aspects of QIS, um, for becoming an expert, there's no substitute for PhD training uh, doing cutting edge research. But we also have a, a growing need for quantum adjacent professionals. Uh, and so people and their careers may benefit from cross training or retraining, perhaps with master's degree programs or internships in, in order to participate in the increasing range of different QIS adjacent activities. And I'd like to make an analogy uh, to automobiles. You know, we don't need um, the automotive industry to be uh, primarily made of PhD scientists all working on the engine. Instead, we need some people working on fuels, some on highways, some on safety and maps. Uh, so, uh, so too, the field of QIS is growing so rapidly, there will be many QIS adjacent skill sets uh, that you mentioned, electrical engineering and cryoengineering uh, and computer science are all, all superbly important for what's coming up. So investing in all of the above is certainly a priority. Um, any other thoughts on this issue of, of meeting the workforce needs? Um, I'm, I'm also curious about, um, you know, a, a lot of our focus has been on, on quantum networking. Um, obviously, there are um, a lot of efforts going on involving quantum computing and, and other sort of applications. Um, and I'm just wondering, how do we how do we develop some synergies between quantum networking and these other areas, particularly involving government activities or, or research activities. Um, anyone want to take that one? Yeah, I can take some of that. Uh, it's it's a very good question. Uh, 
we recognize that uh, quantum communication also means quantum networking, right? And uh, as was mentioned uh, by uh, several speakers before, the networking is a very critical aspect, uh, being able to coherently network nodes. So those nodes could be for communication purposes, if it's a communication link and it requires repeaters, for example, for long distance, but it also could be connecting computers uh, and uh, as we know it today, quantum computers have issues in scaling up uh, the number of qubits uh, or at least the number of qubits that you can use for valuable uh, computation. And so the thought uh, in the current state now is that uh, in order to scale uh, quantum computing, you will need to connect quantum computers. So again, quantum interconnection is critical there. And as was mentioned also by Tatiana and uh, other speakers, uh, connecting sensors uh, to uh, breach uh, the, the gap uh, between the different sensors and uh, increase uh, the sensitivity by putting an array of sensors also is another means of using networking. Uh, so the applications of interconnecting or networking across the, the different applications or potential applications of uh, quantum uh, information science is very, very broad. So communication is going to help computing and computing is going to help communication and all those different fields have to actually work together because they will advance together uh, and some of the critical elements that need to be developed for one of those applications will be needed by other applications as well. Yeah, and, and just to yeah. echo that, um, uh, if I may, uh, right. So, so the two are very much connected: quantum networking and quantum quantum computing. Um, where uh, quantum networks, you can imagine, um, we're talking about many different length, length scales. You could be connecting um, just different chips. So on a on a very sort of microchip kind of length scales, but you still need those quantum networking uh, pieces. You need uh, interfaces. You need um, per perhaps photons. You know um, to to connect them, or um, one can do all the way to um, um, you know, ground to satellite types of distan distances and everything in between where you might need the quantum, quantum repeaters. Quantum repeaters, as somebody pointed out earlier, are really mini quantum computers. So, um, so the two fields uh, are developing in parallel, have a lot of a lot of things in common, and will support each other in terms of uh, development um, uh, of capabilities, components, and even systems. Um, and, and so now I, I think I'd like to turn per, perhaps to Alex because I think that that Alex and the rest of our panelists have done a wonderful job of describing um, sort of what we've done at the U.S. federal government level, um, uh, you know, in terms of establishing priorities um, in programs, um, in terms of laying out sort of research agendas and, and engaging with the private sector and, and universities. Um, but but Alex, I'm wondering sort of what you see going forward, um, what remains yet to be done? Is it is it simply a matter of sort of implementing some of these things or um, is there further work that needs to be done by the US government in order to make all these wonderful things we're talking about a reality? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, so it has been a, a fabulous forum and we've heard from some real experts in the field and the rate of progress is phenomenal. But to make the quantum initiative, the national quantum initiative successful, we really would like to see ways for this new knowledge to impact society. And this is a, a fundamental science question. It's an engineering question. Uh, and it needs all different fields to, to support. Uh, quantum networking in particular is an art or an infrastructure that may support revolutionary advances in several areas of computing, sensing, and communications. But we, uh, when we're midway through the National Quantum Initiative, which as you know from the, the law is framed as a 10-year effort, and midway through we'll have a, an opportunity to reassess and figure out, have we 
discovered enough in some directions to double down and, and focus on building out some of these technologies? Or do we uh, not yet have that kind of a green light or gateway? In which case we may have to um, consider how the strategic plan moving forward will focus on even more fundamental science to understand what are the fundamental limitations and what are the fundamental capabilities of quantum technologies. So to support that, elucidating the benefits, the quantum advantage of quantum networks uh, could be very helpful. And uh, in, we've mentioned these other fields, and it would be it would be fascinating to find out. And I think some other panelists have asked, what would be the equivalent of quantum volume or quantum computational supremacy for quantum networking? So uh, getting the right kind of metrics to track if we're on progress, if we're making progress towards uh, offering transformational advantages uh, that can impact society. That's a direction that we're all interested in supporting. And the way forward is, is not, there's no single silver bullet, right? It takes fundamental research and creative approaches, individual investigators and small groups, large teams that can leverage resources in new ways. All of the above are important to find out what's next. Thank you. Yeah, um, Alex, I think that that's, uh, that that's a wonderful point. And it also reminds me, I think that it's critical to to start to understand some of the benefits of quantum networks and to articulate those at the societal level and then perhaps also at the level of consumers and and most Americans. Um, you know, I work most of my time is spent um, doing spectrum policy. Um, and one of the things that I've observed about that is that nearly every time we've made a significant amount of spectrum available in the United States, um, th there really haven't been well-developed use cases to do with it. You know, when you talk about the 2.5 gigahertz band um, that's now used for unlicensed, it was just junk spectrum that the FCC made available. Um, and then it turned out that there were all these wonderful applications that people thought of um, after it was out there. But I think um, doing some of what you're talking about, but also, um, you know, thinking about that at the level of the ordinary consumer, um, and how it can change their lives, um, it, which is very difficult, obviously, at this point, um, but could also be an important thing for us to think about over the next uh, few years. Um, so any any and closing one thoughts? More, uh, I'm sorry, go one ahead. One more perspective on that, because we, we understand that some of the first applications, some of the first impacts of advanced quantum networking and QIS will be in other branches of science and engineering. And that's okay. That's a, a great place to start to make transformative impacts on society. So I, I will mention something, if I may, uh, because uh, it is actually a concern that uh, we discussed uh, very uh, heavily with this new engineering research center that was uh, funded. And uh, through the communication that we had, the center uh, decided to uh, modify its original scope to actually specifically include a thrust on societal impacts of quantum networking on, uh, on society. Uh, and uh, they have a specific uh, team uh, that is going to uh, look into the uh, societal value and the potential applications and how society will respond to this new technology. And so it, it is, I think, something that's going to be very important because a lot of those new technologies uh, that are so fundamental at this time will have applications that we may not even think of today and being able to think about the impact of developing those uh, technologies and how the society will benefit from it is really critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, well, I think we, we only have a minute or two left. Um, does anyone have any closing remarks that they were hoping to give? Uh, any, any final thoughts on these issues?
Well, I, I want to certainly uh, thank uh, you for uh, and Monisha for inviting me. I think it's been a, a very interesting uh, panel, and I really uh, appreciate uh, the fact that we had a chance to listen to so many different perspectives and uh, see that uh, an agency like FCC is also coming into the folds of uh, this uh, very interesting program, because I think we will need certainly all the agencies working together and especially in the area of uh, communication we certainly need to have uh, uh, communication across agencies as what we had uh, today so uh, thank you for letting me be part of that i appreciate it oh no um thank you to all to you and all our panelists it's been very very interesting um and yeah we um, at the fcc we we don't tend to be a, a research and development sort of agency um, we're a little bit more on, you know, sort of implement, Im implementing con what Congress wants on uh, different uh, uh, sectors involving uh, areas of communications, but um, it has been a fascinating discussion, um, and hopefully this is just the start. Hopefully we can continue some of these discussions um, in the coming years, because um, it's just been absolutely fascinating. It's obviously um, such an important uh, area. So um, I'll turn it back over to Monisha and thank our panelists. I could ask uh, for a minute just to say thank you to the students and the postdocs, professors, the National Laboratory staff, the industry professionals, and the educators who are doing the hard work that is absolutely critical to make the National Quantum Initiative successful. Thank you. Absolutely, Alex, and thank you so much, Matthew. This was a fascinating discussion, and as you were talking about the societal impacts towards the end, I cannot help but thinking about another technology like AI, which sort of, you know, burst upon uh, us as a community, as a society worldwide, and we had not thought a lot about the societal impacts of what this new technology would do and how it would change our way of working and thinking in many aspects. And so starting these societal dialogues early on uh, keeping an eye as to where this technology can be, how it can change what we do is, is super important. And I'm glad that all of the agencies um, ha are thinking about it. So I'd just like to conclude uh, this forum today. Uh, thank you to all of our excellent panelists on this panel, as well as the previous panel for educating us on the state of the art in quantum technologies, especially as they relate to networks. This, this really has to be one of the most exciting fields to be in today, uh, listening to the talks. Uh, and I hope there are students who are listening in who will want to you know, work in this field. Uh, it includes everything. There's basic physics, devices, materials, network architectures, protocols, computer science, policy. Uh, there's plenty of work to be done. And it is clear from the discussions today that the US is in great shape with government funding, academics, large and small companies, even startups. That's always an indication of, uh, you know, when a field begins to mature, uh, gearing up to meet the challenges. Um, as we've seen in other network technologies, maintaining our lead uh, in networks and communications is super important. That uh, network and communicating is, you know, pretty much a national security uh, question nowadays. And I hope this gathering of information that we've been exposed to today has been of help to the audience. Uh, I want to thank everyone at the FCC who helped put this event together and all of the panelists once again. So I'll sign off now with uh, best wishes to everyone who was listening in for the holiday season coming up. Be well. Thank you so much. <laughs>